I'm a park ranger in the United States government, and I deal with a lot of strange things. In fact, just this last week, my dispatch got a call from a woman who was hiking along with her boyfriend. They had seen something they could not explain along the Grizzly Ridge Trail. She described it as an animal that was bipedal, walking on two legs. They were able to see its arms and legs, but they reported it did not have a tail or any fur. I never heard of anything like that before, so I was called out to investigate this sighting myself. Well, I found something all right. I saw something walking across the stream with one leg in the air, almost like it was kind of walking weirdly. It would take these giant strides with one leg in the air, followed by the other, almost like it was bounding across the stream. Maybe it was a coyote at first, but everything about this just did not look right. The reason why I thought this was due to the very wolf-like appearance of the head and eyes that appeared to almost glow in the moonlight. It was roughly six to seven feet tall, if I remember right. It was pretty dark. I thought I was seeing things at first, but after making sure this thing was real, I pulled out my Jetty 22 and shot at it. The thing did not even flinch. I tried to aim for its heart or lungs, but the rounds just seemed to bounce off its body. My first thought was this. Had to be some sort of military experiment gone wrong. The thing just stared at me, but it left after that. I'm not ashamed to admit that I was too afraid to go back into the woods for days after, even though it's my job. This month, things have been really crazy around here. Even animal control had been called out to deal with a pack of canines or something in the park. Ever since mid-June, they would be hunting livestock all over town, and now they've entered here. I just can't get what I saw out of my head, though. It haunts me every minute of the day. Up until now, these strange things had only seemed to be isolated. But were they? Now, I'm hearing reports of these things happening and popping up everywhere. Maybe there's a connection. Bigfoot. The following true story about the Oregon wilderness was told to me by Jim, my aunt's friend, avid hiker and hunter. So I don't remember much of the details. His stories all had basically one particular conclusion, presence of something intelligent in surrounding wilderness. Jim used to hike just like my grandpa, with one little exception that my grandpa was a professional backpacker back in the USSR, which is going to be of some significance later. And he traveled with a group and some firearms. Jim used to go all alone in the wilderness with a firearm as well. Jim's encounters have never ended in particular meeting with an entity, but usually in a form of traces, broken branches, distant howling and roaring, and a feeling that he was being watched, which he actually dismissed as his natural instinctive reaction to unfamiliar environment and vast possibilities. Bears, wolves, moose, all could be around. Except for one such encounter. I don't remember what area he was telling me exactly about, but I'm pretty sure it was one of those rogue river forests in Oregon. So as usual, he left his car at the parking lot and continued afoot. I think he planned for three days, but I'm not sure. Anyway, closer to the dusk, Jim found a place for him to stop. He prepared his dinner using a portable stove, got into his tent and sleeping bag. He then fell asleep. He couldn't recall when it happened but it was already dark outside except for the moon shining over the nearby top, but Jim didn't know that yet. Jim woke up to loud banging noises that appeared to be wood, on wood knocking, but it was so loud he couldn't hear his own commotion as he was pulling the sleeping bag, forcing himself out of it, then pulling the rifle and sending a round into the chamber. He called out once, twice, thrice. At that point he was frightened. The banging never stopped. He poked his rifle out of the tent and squeezed the trigger. Flash illuminated the outside of the tent. The bang followed, and then silence. From what I remember, it was kind of a deafening silence for him. Blood was pulsing in his ears. He was blushing and almost had a vertigo. He also was startled by his own rifle as everything happened so quick he never adapted to the situation. It was silent for not long, but for him, 
it was almost forever. Did I just kill someone? And then roaring and sound of breaking branches not far away. He was so scared and confused he was contemplating whether he should stay inside and wait with a rifle or go outside and pursue the intruder. Jim forced himself out of the tent, screaming, You mother F! Leave me alone! I'll shoot you! There was nothing outside. His eyes just started to get used to the darkness, and within a minute he noticed that a spruce not so far away from him, maybe in a distance of a clear shot, started to swing from one side to another, like if there was something on top of it forcing the tree to break down. It was like that for quite some time, and then it stopped. Jim decided to get inside and wait for sunrise, which he did, and then he quickly grabbed everything he had and made all the way back to the parking lot as fast as he could, and never stopped for longer than enough to catch a breath. As for my grandpa, he was much younger at the time he was hiking and kayaking back to civilization with his group in the Ural. They spent weeks in wilderness, occasionally encountering foresters' cabins or entire villages of the local population called Mansi. They would usually trade something for food, usually alcohol, which was the most valuable product for Mansi, and they would direct them not to go into certain areas deemed cursed or sacred. My grandpa never was a communist, a member of the Communist Party, which was a reason why he was never considered for promotion. He was a deputy director of Aerodynamic Lab at one of the Soviet's mechanical engineering centers, busy with nautical ballistic missiles for submarines, but he sure was atheist. So they would only smirk and do whatever they want, and even then they would encounter some weird shit. I was amazed just how similar Jim's story was to one of my grandpa's stories. I was digging through my grandfather's things a while ago and came upon this report that I thought was very intriguing. This is a report from a soldier located in Falk, Arkansas. He had encountered what he can describe as the Boggy Creek Monster during a shift at night. This is his account, the date unknown. The report was given around 1930, at approximately 20. One hours, our guard posted the usual two men. Shortly after I took over watch, I heard something off the path moving towards me that was large. Thinking it was my relief, I challenged him by name and ordered him to halt. But instead of stopping, this man broke into a run. I then took pursuit, firing several shots at him with my rifle, in order for him to stop, not directly at him, but around him. He apparently was not hit and disappeared into the darkness. I could hear something running away ahead of me for the time, but it soon ceased its noise. I did not see a man or dog, although it might have been a bear going through the underbrush. This would happen over the following nights, and the sentries would each time fire at it, but to no avail. We were never able to catch up with this man, like creature, but it was certainly not a bear. But I cannot say what it is. Maybe some of the wild men from the hills. I know nothing more about this matter except that I never hope to encounter it again. It sounds to me like this soldier had encountered the Boggy Creek Monster. My stepdad lived in Virginia when he was around the age of eight, right on the edge of the great dismal swamp. According to him, he was in bed one night when the sky was cloudless, or just very bright. He never thought until recently whether the moon was shining or not, and saw a beast looking right through his window at him. He said it he could see spittle running down its face, and its eyes were looking straight at him. It was supposedly standing on its hind legs and had cream, red, and brown-colored matted fur and a face almost like a wolf. Other than its snout, its facial features were very human. Its jawbones were high. The structure around its eyes and its eyes themselves were human. Esquire. The coloring of its eyes, he believes, were yellow. The reason why I think this is interesting and possibly valid is because the great dismal swamp covers a huge amount of territory and is hardly touched by humans. Only in recent years have people started to study its inhabitants. The grounds are wet, mossy, and 
absorb sound. And people have been known to wander into it and never return. Who knows what could be lurking in the unknown. Chills my bones. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that he crawled out of his bed and went straight to his mother's room. In the morning when they looked around the house, all the windows had ground that was stirred up under them and grass that was yanked out. There were actual scratches in the wood under his window and paint was missing too. However, as far as they could see, there were no discernible footprints. One morning around 6 a.m. about two years ago, I was living not far from Washington, D.C. A friend of a friend needed a roommate to afford the rent for an apartment he had found. So when I was told about this, my first thought was, Oh, yeah, here's my chance to move out of my parents' house. After about six months of living in the area, I noticed that on certain nights I would hear loud roars in the distance. I could never tell how far away the noise was coming from. It would sometimes sound nearby or just far enough away where I wouldn't mind being outside to see what it might be making the sound from a safe distance. I lived in a quiet, wooded area. A lot of people lived in the area. I actually lived within five minutes walking distance away from the University of Maryland. One morning around 6 a.m. I just snapped awake from a deep, sound sleep for no reason at all. I started to go back to sleep but thought to myself, why am I wide awake and alert? It was strange. I was completely awake. Then right in my backyard I heard a low, deep growl. That's when I knew something was up. The moment I heard that I knew. That was why I woke up. I remained quiet and didn't move for the next five to ten minutes as this thing started to become very active in my backyard. It went from the low growls to heavy breathing. This thing's lungs had to be massive because it sounded the same exact way a horse would if you were standing right next to it. When it breathed through its nose, it sounded more like a horse, but this thing sounded like it was aggressive. I knew it wasn't a horse in the backyard. That wouldn't be possible, but what I saw was very real. It literally ran from my backyard into the dividing fence of my backyard, from my neighbor's backyard again and again. It made no sense for it to be doing that. It would often stop and sniff around and sneeze very loudly. It sounded like it was right next to my window, and uh, I was on the second floor. I didn't want to look out the window because I thought that there is no way in the world no one else is hearing this right now but me. I thought, this thing is trying to get my attention on purpose. I stayed still in bed without moving, and I was beyond scared. I really thought it was a werewolf, even before I saw it. I always thought that they were real. The guys that lived below me started yelling and screaming, El Diablo! Over and over again, they yelled that. I could hear the thing leaving the backyard, so I hurried to try and get a look at it. When I did, all I saw was its backside. This thing was massive, with broad shoulders like a bodybuilder, and it had ears sticking up on its head. It slowly walked away until I lost sight of it. Not intending to mock any religion or beliefs, and I really don't know which group this would be credited to anyway. Wiccans. Druids. Just a psycho. Anyway, I was hiking through a park in central Florida about three years ago. Kind of dense scrub brush. You can only see the trail in front of you. Brush is chest high on both sides. I'm about two miles from the nearest trailhead, and it's around 7 p.m. I had an hour of light left. I intended on setting camp when I found the next clearing. First clearing, I get to has a gator head in the middle with a circle of stones around it. Maybe two, three weeks old. Just a dried skull with scales. Soft tissue was gone. I had seen gator skulls left by poachers before, and I usually ignore it. But it gave me a weird vibe, so I kept walking. About 15 minutes later, and deeper in... I get to another nice-sized clearing. This time, a few dead birds were strung up to some sticks and hanging in a circle like a mobile over a baby crib. Seven or eight small birds. 
maybe four feet across, had been there for a while. It didn't smell anymore, at least. Still creepy enough to send me on my way. Third time's the charm. Right, wrong. Twenty minutes later, and after taking the side paths to get away from the main trail and hopefully avoid any other displays, I find a fresh one. The deer head on a stick, with sticks scattered around, making four circles around the base of the stick. The blood was splattered all around the sticks, fresh enough for the flies to still be on it. The head smelled rancid. Didn't see the body, but I didn't look for it either. I got out of there. I was dark before I got back to my truck. Called fish and game the next morning, because the gator and deer would have been taken out of season. Told them what I found, and apparently this wasn't the first time somebody called about animal effigies in that park. Never went back, but I am curious just how many other shrines were out there. Not sure what it is. My girlfriend and I were hiking around western Maryland, and I started getting an eerie feeling, and I seen something following. Stalking us, but it wasn't as big as what I've heard these dogmen to be. Also, there's a little equipment yard where I sometimes work on vehicles, and behind the yard is a cornfield. And it had been cut down, and in the middle of this field is an island of trees. While I was working one afternoon, I heard what sounded like fifty wolves. Howling at once, I turned around and seen something crouching down very low to the ground, coming out of the island of trees. Looked a lot like the thing that had been following my girlfriend and I, but that was at least twenty miles away. Also, there's an area nearby where my father told me that he and his friends would see this wolfman thing running next to their vehicle in the 1960s and supposedly had killed a lot of livestock in the area. I came across this article of something called the Snarly Yo. It was on the same mountain my father has all these werewolf stories about. I will try to upload the article for you. The area is around Hagerstown, Maryland. I was hiking in the Barrington Tops, Australia, New South Wales, Australian state, and stopped at a place called Dead Horse Swamp. Lovely sight. Got a drop toilet there, which is a luxury in a waterfall nearby. Cut to nighttime, and I had downed my fire since it was bushfire season, so I could go to sleep. Cut to a few hours later, and I hear rustling and grunting. Thought it might have been a kangaroo or wallaby, and shrugged it off. I had stored my food and supplies in the toilet block, which had a lockable door, so it couldn't attract animals, but I figured they must smelt something. The rustling continues, and I hear grunting and shuffling. So being the coward I am, I freeze in my tent and pray that whatever it was doesn't come near me. Well, it did, and I hear this loud, heavy breathing and grunting, followed by heavy footsteps. And at this point, I'm shaking in fear. I start praying to any God that have me and remain as still as I could. The thing went to the opening of my tent, which had a flimsy little zipper to keep whatever it is outside and stopped. So I did what any grown man who is fearing for his life does, and I scream my lungs out. I hear a stampede of feet run away from the tent, and the rest of the night is quiet. I stayed up all night, and as soon as dawn hit, I made my way to my car and got the F out of there. Probably was a Bigfoot, but gee damn, did I think it was Ivan Milat or Ted Bundy coming to skin me alive. After grad school, I moved into a house that my grandparents owned in rural East Georgia. They would visit every once in a while but for weeks at a time I was completely alone. This house is in the literal middle of nowhere and is on about 20 acres or so surrounded by woodlands. The property is at the end of an easement off a dirt road, off a rural paved road, off of a state highway. I had a few neighbors, but the nearest house was over a mile and a half away. 
I wake up one morning to go for a run down the easement to the dirt road when I notice a set of unique, approximately sized, ten footprints going towards my house. I follow them all the way to the carport where they disappeared either onto the concrete or the grass. No one other than me had been at the house in almost two weeks. It had rained a few days earlier, which meant the tracks were discernible and relatively fresh. The door was locked and I was ready to run, so I decided to back, track them, to see where they originated from. I followed them six of a mile down the easement. I followed them eight of a mile down the dirt road to the intersection of the paved road where I lost the trail. They were definitely a one-way set of prints that ended almost a mile and a half down the road at my carport. I began to freak out. I called someone and let them know what I found in case I went missing. I returned to their vanishing point at the carport and attempt to track them through the grass. I'm not a skilled tracker by any means, but I hadn't cut the grass in a while and thought that I could follow them. Turns out I could. They went down the property line and into the woods. I followed them about 20 feet until I came to the creek that runs along the southernmost property boundary. The footprints clearly walked through the mud and into the creek. They didn't come out the other side. I checked up and down the creek side and couldn't find an exit point. Judging from the path the person took, they knew where they were going. There were no stopping points. There were no deviations in the direction. No moves in either direction and no zigzagging. They walked from the paved road in a single direction down a dirt road and down an easement along the edge of my house, down the tree line, and into a creek. Also, did I mention they were barefoot? I spent three months working in Alaska in a remote area about two hours north of Anchorage during the summer five years ago. It was summertime, so the darkest it would get would be considered dusk anywhere else. I often took walks down to the river alone, which was about a three-mile walk from my compound, very secluded and quiet. One evening I wasn't tired and decided to head to the river to see if I could find any wildlife wandering around. I love animals. It was about two of them. It was the darkest time of day. The sun wasn't visible, but it wasn't completely dark. When I got to the river, I poked around for a while and listened to my surroundings. Then I heard the most eerie sound of my life. I heard what sounded like the alien ships from War of the Worlds. It was like a trombone sound multiplied by a thousand. It was so loud I covered my ears. There was no construction, no people playing instruments, nothing that could explain what this sound was. Christmas of 2007 was an event that has always stood out in my mind, and now it always will. I was 13 at the time, and that was the first and only year that Dad missed Christmas. He worked as a long-haul truck driver, and we were used to him being gone for weeks or even occasional months at a time. He always made it a point to be home for our birthdays and Christmas, however, but that year was different. Mom was worried when he said he had one final load to deliver before the holiday season. His plan was to make his delivery and then be home on the 23rd, just in time for Christmas, but Mother Nature had other ideas. As fate would have it, his route from our home in Minneapolis to Billings, Montana would take him right into the heart of a looming blizzard along I-94. Snow was falling in bunches at the time, and Dad said he was debating whether or not to pull over for the night in hopes it would clear up. He decided to try and just keep going, when the road made the decision for him. He was only about an hour away from Billings when his truck struck an unexpected patch of ice, causing him to lost control and slide off the road into the median. Thankfully, he wasn't injured, but his truck was wedged in nearly two feet of packed snow. It was around midnight when this happened. He tried everything he could to get the truck out of the snowdrift, but it was no use. Of course, his phone signal was non-existent as well, so he couldn't even call for assistance. The roads were virtually devoid of other travelers by that point as well. 
He radioed in to a local emergency office, but was told the roads were too hazardous to travel at the moment. In the end, he could do nothing but wait. Meanwhile, Christmas came and went for us, and we didn't hear anything from Dad. Mom was a nervous wreck, although she tried to hide it, while me and my two sisters were just sad that he wasn't there with us. Thankfully, Dad finally called late on Christmas evening. He apologized profusely for not being with us and promised he would get home as soon as possible. He did just that two days later, and we were relieved to have him back. He returned with a bundle of late Christmas gifts, and all was well once more. Dad was different, though. He was quiet and appeared as though his mind was focused elsewhere. I didn't question him on it, but I could tell that something was troubling him. Life went on, and Dad never missed another Christmas after that. He, in fact, began just taking the entire month of December off to prevent anything like that ever happening again. I didn't know this at the time, but he later told me that he never drove down I-94 again. He outright refused deliveries that took him along that stretch and would take detours that added multiple hours to his trip if it meant avoiding that spot. Us kids are all grown up now with kids of our own. My son just turned two, and our whole family was once again together over this previous Christmas. We sat around watching as Mom and Dad lovingly spoiled their grandchildren with goodies. I don't think I've ever seen my dad with such a beaming smile. Later that night, when the sugar rush had finally worn off and the kids had gone to bed, Dad and I were left alone on the balcony. We sipped some of his whiskey and puffed on cigars as we got to talking. I'll skip over the bulk of what we talked about, because that's not really why I'm here. Eventually, we started talking about his newfound retirement from truck driving, and I asked him a question which I'd never really asked before. You ever experience anything really creepy on the road? Dad was no stranger to talking about his experiences. He had infamous tales of him getting mobbed by crackheads in Atlanta, hitting a cow in Nebraska in the things he saw while driving through Ferguson a few years back during the civil unrest. He was never shy to tell them, but this time he paused. He swished the whiskey around his glass for a moment as if silently debating whether he wanted to tell me. I guess I might as well tell you now. He downed the remainder of his drink and clasped his hands in front of him. You remember the year I missed Christmas? By this point, I had almost entirely forgotten about it. But when he said that a torrent of memories came spiraling back, Yeah, Mom was pissed, I replied. Dad gave a hearty chuckle at that and nodded. Oh yeah, she never let me forget it. That was that crazy blizzard, right? When your truck got stuck... Dad nodded. Yep, damn near flipped my rig that night. Ironically, that snowdrift probably saved my life just as much as it screwed me over. He then paused and broke eye contact as he contemplated his wording. That wasn't the scary part, though. Dad explained that the area he went off the road was essentially a barren wasteland. No cities or gas stations around him, just a winding expanse of road in both directions between dozens of foothills. He again mentioned he had no cell reception and wasn't sure what to do aside from just wait for someone to pass by. After a few minutes, it became apparent that wasn't going to happen. The snow fell in buckets that night, and before long, it nearly reached the bottom of his door. Dad's truck at the time was a Cascadia 125 mid-roof sleeper. He had a full sleeping compartment behind the front seat and provisions to last him a few weeks if necessary. He wasn't too worried about being stranded, at least not at first. After giving up on getting his phone to work, he crawled into the bunk area of the cab and popped a DVD in his portable TV. He figured he may be stuck out there for at least the night, so he might as well just relax until help arrived. He made sure to insist that if he wanted to, he could have probably figured out a way to get his truck out, if he really tried but he was exhausted and decided to just get some sleep. He said he drifted off not long after, only to awake some time later to complete darkness. The temperature had plummeted, and he instinctually hugged his arms and felt the goosebumps lining his arms. He'd left his truck idling before he fell asleep, but it wasn't running anymore. 
Confused, he crawled into the front seat to find the keys still in the ignition. He twisted the key, and the engine soon rumbled back to life. But something was wrong. He said the noise of the engine morphed into a gurgling, clanging mess of metal and fluid that produced a god awful cacophony. His dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree, displaying just about every single warning light the system had. Steam began to pour from the hood vents, and a distinct smell of boiling coolant filled the air. After letting it run maybe ten seconds, he shut it off in fear of doing permanent damage to it. He knew that something wasn't right with it and sighed as he contemplated going out into the cold night to see if he could figure out what it was. He bundled himself up tight and popped the hood. He said the night had this almost ethereal silence to it as he stepped out of the cab. His feet crunched in the snow, echoing like crashing thunder when compared to the pervasive silence. He made his way around the front and opened it up, releasing a plume of steam from within. After it dissipated a bit, he leaned in and found something which made him quite confused. Oil and coolant was splashed all over the underside of the hood, with many other parts of the engine covered in gunk as well. Dad climbed off the grill and glanced underneath the carriage, and that's when he found something truly odd. The oil pan was shredded on the bottom of the engine. He said it looked as though someone had chopped it with an axe a couple dozen times. The oil had all spilled out into the snow beneath. Clearly, that was why the engine had been running so rough, but explaining how it happened was another matter entirely. He checked around the area and said it seemed like some of the oil was dripped away from the road and towards the trees. He looked closer and spied what very much seemed like footprints accompanying them, as if the winter night wasn't cold enough that discovery really tanked his blood temperature. He quickly headed back towards his cab, but as he reached for the handle, something stopped him dead in his tracks. Something moved behind the end of his trailer, too quick to make out any physical details. It moved on two legs and was clearly no animal. Dad just froze, his fight-or-flight instinct seeming to stalemate within him. He thought about calling out, but said that didn't seem like a good idea. After a few seconds of silence, he made a mad dash to his cab and locked the doors behind him. After grabbing the pistol from underneath his seat, he hopped into the rear with his heart racing. He positioned himself where he was able to glance out both side mirrors, but saw no sign of whoever was behind the trailer. The radio, too, was out, and after trying in vain to get it to work, he sat back. It didn't make any sense to him. Even if the engine wouldn't fire up the batteries, should have had enough reserve charge to power the radio for a little while. He tried calling on Biz's cell phone, too, and although managed to get it to ring a few times, it would always just cut out. Hours passed, and not much of anything happened. He dosed off once or twice, but tried his best to stay awake and wait for the sun to rise. The snow had since stopped, but not a single other car had driven by since he had stopped. He figured the pass itself was closed, but hoped someone would been by... Sometime later, he heard a noise emanate from outside. It started as a slight thump with another soon following, then another and another. The sounds gradually grew louder, and his heart lodged in his throat as it grew nearer. Someone was on his trailer, and he didn't know what to do about it. He clutched his pistol tight, aiming it up towards the roof. Just as he was certain the person was about to reach the roof of the cab, the sound stopped. He waited there, pistol trembling in his grip for them to emerge, but they never did. Minutes turned to hours, and he never heard another sound from the roof. He said after a while he was no longer even sure whether he had heard anything to begin with. Eventually his guard slipped and the drowsiness took over. He doesn't know if this next part is related, but he's never had anything happen like it, so I figured I'd include it too. He dreamed as he slept there, but it wasn't a normal dream. He said he remembers walking through a dark forest and viewing it all with incredible vivid detail. He was completely lucid and says to this day, almost 30 years later, it was the most incredibly realistic dream he's ever had. Even looking back on it, he says it felt so real it's hard for him to distinguish it from reality. He seemed genuinely disturbed as he told me about it, too. 
The forest he was walking through had these massive looming trees that seemed hundreds of feet tall. Twisted roots surrounded their bases, which sprouted from the ground and twisted all over like the tentacles of the kraken. He had to dip and duck around them as he moved, going further but not knowing why. As he made his way through, he started hearing this noise like the ticking of a clock. It got louder as he moved. Then, sure enough, he found the source. A large grandfather clock ticking away in the middle of a bundle of roots. He stopped and stared at it for a moment as it ticked away. The clock's tone reverberated, but began to slow. In a few moments, it had began ticking much slower, and the clock itself began to melt. Suddenly, he saw things emerging in the distance from behind the trees. Horrible twisted creatures like the spawns of hell. The sounds of cackling and snarling swirled around him, and he began to run. He hurtled and leapt through the roots, but didn't make it far. Something struck him hard from behind, knocking him onto his chest. He then awoke with a gasp, panting heavily with a cold sweat permeating his entire body. He scrambled to a seated position while on the brink of panic. His heart was throbbing so fast and hard that it ached. He took a moment to compose himself, and the immense relief that overcame him was one of sheer relief. But it did not last. Something moved at his window, and his eyes shot up. There he saw the face staring back at him. He froze as stiff as a corpse and cold as a glacier. Time seemed to stand still then, but finally he found the strength to raise his pistol. He fired without really even thinking. A loud bang reverberated in, and the muzzle flare momentarily disoriented him. He looked up to see a bullet hole in the window, and no sign of the face. After waiting there a few moments, he ventured to the driver's seat and peered out, but there was nothing there. No sign of that thing ever being there. It didn't make sense to him, as he was certain he saw it. What made even less sense was the fact that his phone read that it was only 12.13 a.m. Last he remembered checking his phone, it read 12, 8 a.m., and he swears on everything that had to have been at least an hour before he dozed off. By this point in his story, I had to question myself on whether he was pulling my leg. My father is a bit of a prankster for sure, but he's never weaved an elaborate story like this before. He then spent some time glancing around out the windows and ensuring no one else was around. He almost thought he should just leave his truck and start walking back to town, but obviously that was an incredibly dangerous notion that probably would gotten him killed. He stared at his phone for quite a while, watching the minute. Slowly, tick onward, too slowly. He swore time wasn't working as normal. Several times he counted aloud to sixty, doing his best to approximate a minute, but the minute didn't change accordingly. He eventually just kept counting upwards, finding the minute finally changed when he reached 386. You'd think that after all these worrying discoveries that sleep would have been the last thing he wanted, but it wasn't enough to prevent. He said he tried adamantly to resist the urge, but the drowsiness that overtook him was impossible to fight. He found himself walking in the snow, listening as it crunched beneath his feet. A dark and silent forest surrounded him in all directions. It was robotic, as if his body acted of its own accord, while his mind drifted in the doldrums. He could barely see where he was going, but it didn't seem to matter. Suddenly he stopped and seemed to spring back to reality. He glanced around side to side, a sudden terror gripping him. Where was he? Why was he outside of his truck? He wondered. He spun back but couldn't even see the road behind him. The cold sunk into him, and then he saw it. From further in the woods, a familiar face stared back, pale, gaunt, and inhuman. It crawled on all fours, shimmering and shifting side to side. My father turned the complete other way and ran like hell. Tree branches raked against him as he fled half-blind away from the thing in the woods. Nothing looked familiar, and he just continued running aimlessly through the woods, checking behind him periodically to see if the thing was following him. He never saw it or heard it, but he knew it was there. Eventually, he smelled the faint scent of smoke lingering in the air. He followed it, hearing a commotion behind him, and soon came across a small clearing. In the center of it was a log cabin with smoke 
trickling from the chimney. Seeing no other option, he dashed towards it and knocked on the door. Behind him, he could hear odd sounds coming from the woods, and thankfully the door opened a few seconds later. Who are you? What do you want? The voice of elderly man called from within. Dad turned and saw the barrel of a shotgun aimed at his chest. He slowly raised his hands to convey he meant no threat. Please, sir, there's... He said he paused as he thought that certainly this man was going to think he was some lunatic, but he said it anyways. There's something out there. The man's furious glance reverted to one of intrigue. He then looked past my dad and out into the forest, his eyes suddenly growing wide. Suddenly he backed up, still aiming the shotgun and my dad while waving him inside. He pointed him over to a chair in the corner. Dad complied and sat as the man locked up behind him. He waited there a couple seconds there, but apparently heard nothing of concern. What are you doing out here? My dad then told him what had happened with his truck and the blizzard. He then told him about the odd occurrences that had happened later on, which culminated in him suddenly sleepwalking through the woods. The man sighed and finally lowered his shotgun. He got my dad some water and took a seat across from him. A lot of weird things in these woods. Dad paused as he waited for the man to continue. The man formally introduced himself as Duncan and said his family had owned that plot of land for nearly 100 years. He said he lost count of how many search parties had come through over the years, as well as thrill-seekers, ghost hunters, and generally odd people. I saw a face. Dad finally confessed to him. Duncan eyed him curiously. What kind of face? Dad described it much as he had before, and Duncan just shook his head. Well, that's a new one. He let out a sarcastic chuckle then. You hear all kinds of stories. UFOs, Bigfoot, cults. But none of them can ever provide proof. So you don't believe in any of it? My dad asked, only to be countered by Duncan. Of course I do. I've lived out here long enough to know that we humans do not dictate these woods. There are things that lurk in shadows all over the globe, and we may never understand them. But as for what you saw, he paused for a moment, seeming to contemplate as he folded his hands on his lap. There's a group of Native Americans that are rumored to have once lived here. The Apulkery. Ever hear of them? Dad shook his head. Neither had I. But a friend of mine who has since passed told me about him. He was an Arapaho man himself, and said that for generations his people had told tales of these. A pokery, most other groups feared them, said the things they did were evil, more so than the standard tribal warfare one would expect. People say they held these rituals and experiments, and were rumored that their cruelty was matched only by their intellects. Some people say they weren't even human, but that's neither here nor there. Duncan trailed off once more, taking a sip of tea from his side table. One of the rumors that many people attribute to the apulkery is that of the wrong ones. A lot of names for them, really. Not rights, liars, and uncannies. Things that look human but ain't, and some look less human than others. Long faces, wide mouths, huge eyes. A lot out of variations. Some say they can affect time and space itself and others blame them for a lot of weird disappearances. He paused and took another sip, then chuckled. I can't speak to the validity of all that firsthand, but things for certain. There are a lot of weird disappearances, and no one seems to have an answer for them. The air from the room seemed to deflate from his torso, and Dad eyed the curious man. He'd clearly seen a lot over his time, but Dad didn't know how much of his tales to believe. He still doesn't. If all these things are happening, then why do you live out here? Dad finally asked. Duncan reclined in the seat and thought. Dad expected an answer related to his inherited property, but the reality was a bit different. He did in fact mention his ancestral home being part of it, but had more to say. If I was twenty years younger, maybe I would leave, but I don't think it'd matter. There ain't a place on earth you could run to if they wanted to get you. Dad said a shiver descended his spine then, and Duncan didn't seem boastful or wild as he spoke, but more as though his realization was just a foregone conclusion. 
Thankfully, Duncan allowed my dad to stay the night, and in the morning, the two of them made their way back to the road. Luckily, Duncan had a big Dodge diesel that was able to plow through the snow with relative ease. They soon reached my dad's abandoned rig, finding it in even worse state than he'd last seen it the previous night. Multiple tires were slashed, windows were broken, and the engine was absolutely shredded from the bottom. After looking around, though he found nothing had actually been stolen. Duncan gave him a ride into town to get his truck towed, and a week or so later he was finally headed home. So, do you believe in that kind of stuff? I finally asked him after he seemed to be done retelling his story. Well, I'd be kind of stupid not to now. He and I both laughed at that, but clearly he had more he wanted to say. It was a really weird experience for sure. But I've always thought that maybe I misremembered it, or subconsciously exaggerated it in my mind. Something about it, though, is just so haunting. Like I saw something that night that I really wasn't supposed to see, and never want to see again. He just sat there for a moment in silence, and I figured it best not to ask him any more questions. He eventually told me that between the time of him crashing his truck to when he finally made it, into town with Duncan that three entire days had passed. He still doesn't know how to account for that, and apparently Duncan didn't either. There's a lot of unanswered questions to this that he may never get the answer to now. He kept in touch with Duncan over the years, but unfortunately he passed away back in 2019. I love my dad, and it's disconcerting seeing him that way. Confused and terrified. I cannot completely attest to the validity of his story, but I believe him. For many who read this, I'm sure it will just amount to words on a paper or maybe a fictitious story that entertained you for a few minutes, but to me it's a horrific possibility at the very least. If anyone has any experiences like this or theories, then feel free to share them. Whatever the case, you won't catch me anywhere near a 94 in Billings anytime soon. Anyway, this story I'm going to tell you now comes from one summer when I was working with the National Park Service out in Yellowstone. I was lucky enough to spend five years working for the park, and to this day, it is still one of my favorite locations. Now, for those of you who have not been to Yellowstone before, let me just tell you that this park is big. So big, in fact, that many park rangers believe that there are hermits who live off the grid in the park year-round in some of the remote places that don't see tourists and visitors and are able to go more or less undetected because there are so many places you could hide. Over the years there, I encountered some really weird stuff in the Yellowstone wilderness that would suggest that this is either true or that there is some strange dark energy at play out there. But the dark energy doesn't confine itself to the park boundaries, as I found out one year. Midsummer, when I was 27, two of my co-workers, who I'll call Nick and Monica instead of using their real names, and I had the same day off and decided to go out to a nearby lake in southern Montana, right outside the northwest corner of the park. Nick used to be a scuba diving instructor and had a ton of gear along with a few wetsuits. So we decided to scuba dive and explore around the submerged ruins in Quake Lake. For those of you who don't know the story of how Quake Lake was formed, here's a quick history. In August 1959, a magnitude 7.3 earthquake struck the area in the middle of the night, causing a large chunk of one of the mountains to fall in a landslide that buried 19 people alive in their sleep and created a dam in the Madison River. This dam resulted in the creation of Quake Lake, as it later was named. Overall, the area affected by the earthquake had a total of 28 fatalities, and damage was reported in a huge radius around the area. The part of all this that the public doesn't know about, however, is the disappearances that started happening after the formation of Quake Lake that had nothing to do with the earthquake and subsequent damage. The government did a very thorough job covering all of it up as to not alarm the public, and most NPS employees don't even know about it unless they are working directly in the area. 
As a five-year veteran working at Yellowstone, I knew about the strange disappearances and unsolved cases, but I was told under strict order not to tell anyone about them. Basically, once Quake Lake was deemed stable enough for recreational activity, people started going out there to swim, fish, go boating, and do all the other normal things that people do on a lake. However, soon after the lake started getting visitors, people started mysteriously disappearing, all from the same area of the lake. Sometimes they would turn up all the way across the lake, drowned. Sometimes they would never turn up at all. But the thing that made the government cover this all up was that with each body they actually found, the person died with a look of absolute terror on their face and bruises around their legs and ankles that looked like the shape of human hands. The government did countless tests and surveys of the lake to try to determine what this could be from, but they never found anything. So they covered it all up and placed restrictions on areas that could be accessed by the general public. Despite knowledge of the disappearances, Nick, Monica and I weren't worried about it. Nick assured us that all his dabbing gear was in top shape. And since Monica and I were both strong swimmers, we didn't give it a second thought. The area that we were going to dive at is called the Underwater Forest. It was given that name because of all the trees you can still see sticking out of the water from when the lake originally formed. We knew there were some underwater ruins close by as well from a cabin that got submerged in the flooding, so we figured that would be a really cool place to dive and explore. So, we packed up all of the diving gear in our into Nick's car, hooked his boat up to the trailer hitch, and set out for the lake. It was just about midday when we got there. We had a quick picnic lunch, then started to put our gear on while we digested. Nick gave both Monica and I a quick tutorial on how to use all of the gear, and we did a few test dives next to the boat dock to make sure we were ready. Once we felt good to go, we took off for the side of the lake we were going to explore. As soon as we arrived, we anchored our boat and got ready to jump in. Immediately, I got a bad feeling, like we shouldn't be there, but I brushed it off as nervousness and excitement. I touched the water next to the boat, and it sent chills up my spine. The water in the lake was cold, but this felt really, really cold. I shuddered, then Nick noticed and started making fun of me, so I rolled my eyes and put on my mask. We jumped in the water and started exploring. As soon as I got in the water, all my fears went away. This place was so cool. It was like a whole forest frozen in time, dead, underwater. We had all agreed ahead of time to try to stay near each other, but just in case, Nick had given us all waterproof diving watches so we could keep track of time. We agreed that we would surface every 20 minutes just to check in with each other if we got separated. Naturally, within about five minutes, we were all off on our own, but we all surfaced on time for the first two check-ins. However, on the third check, in Monica didn't surface on time. Nick and I waited a couple minutes, thinking that maybe she just didn't look at her watch. After about ten minutes, we started to panic. We made a plan to stick together to look for her, and immediately dove back down into the water. We searched for about twenty minutes, and there was no sign of her. We decided to return to the boat and radio into the marina to get help, and within a matter of minutes, they had sent a search and rescue team out to help find her. Every single minute waiting felt like an eternity. Then suddenly, one of the search and rescue divers surfaced with Monica's unconscious body. All of her diving gear had been torn to shreds and was just barely hanging on to her. The search and rescue boat sped off back to the marina so Monica could be airlifted to the nearest hospital. Nick and I closely followed behind in his boat. Once we got back to the marina, we were questioned by the cops and then released. They told us where they were taking Monica, and Nick and I made plans to go visit her the next morning. Neither Nick nor I was able to sleep that night. We sat on the couch together at his apartment, watching movies until the sun came up, and then we got in his car and headed for the hospital where Monica was. She was asleep when we got there, so we decided wait until she woke up. 
We asked one of the nurses if she had said what happened, and the nurse said she hadn't spoken a single word to anyone since she arrived. She also said that Monica would start to freak out if anyone tried to touch her ankles. Hearing this made the blood drain from my face. Once the nurse left the room, I slowly and gently lifted up the blanket by Monica's feet and looked. There were deep, dark red and purple bruises all over her calves and ankles in the shape of human hands, as if people had been grabbing at her and dragging her by the bottoms of her legs. The feeling of the blanket moving immediately woke Monica up, and she jolted up in a panic with the whitest eyes I have ever seen. As soon as she realized it was just Nick and I, she started crying. I sat down next to her on the bed and just held her. I asked her if she wanted to talk about what happened, and once she calmed down, what she said, I will never forget. I saw a little girl. She was standing upright on the lake floor as if she was outside on dry land. She motioned to me to follow her, so I did. She was running through the trees, and once we got to the edge of the underwater forest, there was a cabin with a light on inside. She pointed at the door and then ran inside. I was terrified, but curious, so I followed her in. As soon as I opened the door and entered the cabin, the little girl turned to me, smiled, and turned out the light. The cabin door swung shut and locked. I couldn't open it back up as hard as I tried. I swam to one of the windows and started hitting it until a glass cracked. I tried to squeeze through the window, but the oxygen tank was too big to fit. I felt something grab at my ankle, and I turned around, and there was the little girl, although she now was floating in the water, and she looked like a corpse. Her skin was gray and falling off her bones, and her eyes were solid white. Out of nowhere, two more of these people appeared. They looked like her parents, perhaps. They started grabbing at me and pulling me back into the cabin, tearing at my wetsuit with their nails and teeth. I fought as hard as I could and tore off my oxygen tank and started fighting them off with it. I managed to kick them off of me just as I was able to squeeze through the broken window, and I swam as fast as I could away from the cabin without turning back. Within a matter of seconds, I was so out of breath that I passed out, and the next thing I knew, I was in the hospital. Monica said that she told the search and rescue officers everything she told us. We were told that they did a thorough search operation for the cabin Monica said she saw, but they claimed that they found nothing. I'm not sure what exactly happened that day in the lake, but I do know that what I saw on Monica's legs, plus the fear in her eyes when she told Nick and I her story, I believe her. I've never gone back to that lake, but I did hear from a co-worker that they now have that area strictly closed off. Maybe they did find something after all. While I was on duty a few years back, we had to respond to a call about hikers that were late. It was pretty routine. Just two young kids who had gotten lost where they were going. They were actually from out of state, so they weren't used to this rain. We found them again before nightfall. They were pretty freaked out. They said they'd been hearing this weird noise coming out of the woods around them. They'd been scared into this spot, actually. They said the noise had gotten closer and closer and was with them for most of the day. They didn't know what it was, but they were pretty determined to get out of there. We escorted them back to base, but I knew we were being followed the whole time. Something in the woods behind us was chasing them. It was staying just out of the light. I had my rifle on it the whole time, but I never saw anything out there. I know I heard something, though. It was breathing hard and making these strange noises. I kept looking behind me, but all I could see were silhouettes of trees in the sky. I didn't see what was making the noise until we were almost at the ops when I found it. It was big and built low to the ground. Then it got down and began running on all fours. It had a very featureless face, unlike anything I had seen before. I don't know what it was, but I'm not sure I want to know. Another night, I was working the graveyard shift alone. We got a call over the radio that somebody had seen something large and unknown. And we were all pretty tired this night. Most of us had been on duty for 20 hours already. 
The area this thing went into was a mix of densely forested and open fields. The guy who saw the thing said it kind of looked like a large black blur moving through a field at an incredible speed. So my partner and I were looking down at the edge of the wood line, and we heard something come out near us. It sounded big, whatever it was, very big. We switched with another team after about an hour. They had to go deeper. We took up on their first post. But my partner told me to go over a small hill, giving us a better vantage point on the forested area beyond it. As I'm walking toward where she told me to go, she gets on the radio and starts screaming at everyone to get out. She's yelling about how this big black thing is coming right at us, but I don't hear it. I finally see her come over the hill towards me, and she tells me this thing was chasing after us. She said it looked like a hairy large dog with large yellow eyes, but that it had legs just like a man, not hawks like a dog. It had caught up with her before she could get down the other side of the road, so she came back up here to avoid it. The rest of my team who had seen it were all white as sheets, especially my partner who looked warmed over. None of them could really tell us what we saw, and we never really did find out, at least not from them. It was a heck of a night. As a search and rescue officer, it is our duty to search and conduct every day. It was just another normal day as I patrolled back and forth searching for anything unusual. So many days, it's the same boring routine, and just as I was thinking this, I heard something. I wonder if there is anything else around me, because as I got closer, I could tell it sounded like a man screaming for help. This was my chance to make a difference. The more I followed the sound, the more I could really tell it was a man screaming for help. When I found him, he was crouched down on his knees, covered in mud. It looks like he had not eaten in days and appeared torn and beaten. He screamed at me to help him, and then he began sobbing, explaining that something large and hairy grabbed him out of the woods and took him here, told him that if he left, it would kill him. Then he informs me it's watching us right now, and right at that moment, I started to hear this low, rumbling growl come from the woods close by. This is a moment where I literally pooped bricks as I reached down for my sidearm. I see this massive shape jump out of the trees, swoop down at this man, pick him up in one full swoop, and disappear off into the trees. The only sound that carried was him screaming, now becoming more faint in the distance, till it completely ceased, all happening within five seconds. Clearly, we were dealing with something we were outmatched. I immediately radioed for backup, and unfortunately, they weren't much help. They told me it was already being worked on, and that I was not to talk about it or deal with it. In fact, I was let go. They informed me I would no longer be handling this investigation, and even threatened my job if I talked about it. Well, here I am, so that's why I'm reporting this anonymously. I'm sorry this is so long, but there are things out there that are going on that people are not talking about. Things like this, where people are disappearing. That poor man, I don't even know if he's still alive or whatever became of it. And I can't say for sure what that thing was that grabbed him. Was it a Bigfoot? I don't know. It moved far too quickly for me to ever know for sure. I think I have a Sasquatch problem, so throughout the days we take our two dogs outside to their kennels so they can get out of the house for a while and run and play and such. These are not small dogs. One is a black lab, husky mix, and the other one is a full-blooded Staffordshire Terrier, pit bull. The kennels are placed at the edge of the yard near the woods. These woods are big, large enough to take a day to go hiking through them. Lately, when it gets dark, the dogs seem on edge. They will bark and whine toward the house to come in. At first, I figured they just wanted to get back into the house, but now I'm thinking they're actually scared. Three nights ago, when I went to get them, it was already dark, but we have a security light so it isn't pitch black or anything. I got to the front of the first kennel and noticed both dogs were being quiet. They always bark at me excitedly when I go to get them but they were dead silent. This weirded me out a little, but 
not to the point of being scared. I will admit that there was a certain uneasiness in the air, though. Something I can't explain, but it sort of felt electric, like I was about to be shocked. The longer I was there, the more uneasy I felt. I started getting the first dog, the lab, out and heard a heavy snap in the woods near the kennels. I froze. The dogs froze. By this time, I was so on edge that if someone had spoken, I would have jumped, screamed, and possibly ran. The creepy feeling in the air just kept getting thicker. The lab had her bushy tail stuffed underneath her and was whining. This didn't make me feel any better. The pit bull was as far away from the woods as she could get, whimpering for me to come get her. I can only take one dog in at a time because they get too excited and will sometimes try to fight, so I avoid that at all costs. I felt so bad leaving the pity there by herself, but I had to do it. As I walked away, she barked this high-pitched whining type of bark at me that I've never heard her do before. The lab couldn't get to the house quick enough. I went back for the other one and dreaded every step as her door is right at the base of the woods. I would have to turn my back to the woods to open her door and get her out. The air felt heavy and stale with an unpleasant smell like a dead skunk as I approached the kennel. Another snap and I was about ready to run for it, but I didn't want to leave my dog, who had her head down defensively facing the woods. I could barely make it. To be honest, it felt like trying to walk through water. I was terrified by the time I reached the door. I heard heavy breathing behind me as I got my dog out. She was scared too, but started growling behind me. I was frozen in place. The breathing continued for a minute before I heard steps started coming toward us. We both took off at the same time. A terrifying scream came out of the base of the wood. I didn't dare look back. I just ran. My pity pulled me all the way back to the house. I got in, flipped off all the lights, and stared out the window at the woods. I could see something moving slightly, but just out of the light. It moved back and forth for about five minutes, then disappeared. It took me forever to fall asleep that night because I was so scared that every little noise freaked me out. The next night I went to get the dogs earlier, right around dusk. I thought all was good until I was getting my pity out. A huge snapping sound, like a tree branch had just been snapped in half, rang out. It sounded pretty far away, so I just hurriedly got my dog and started toward the house. A few steps away from the kennel, I heard something big start charging toward me from inside the woods. We ran again, and it appeared to follow for so long, then retreated back. Now, every night since then, I hear sounds coming out of the woods like branches breaking and being thrown around, knocking on trees and roaring. I am absolutely terrified. I no longer even take my dogs down. I just take them for walks during the day and make sure we are all in before dusk. I don't know what to do. I'm thinking about buying a gun, but I'm not sure it will help. I was in a 24-hour shopping center car park waiting for a friend who works there at around 10 p.m. Suddenly, a kid pops out of the window screen and starts tapping. I'm thinking, where the hell did he come from? Hmm, is he trying to rob me? Anyway, I roll the window down only partially and remember that my doors are locked, so I feel a little bit safer. I ask the kid, what do you want? Sir, I'm lost. Can you take me home? I ask where are your parents, as it was late at night and there was no one else visible on the same floor I was waiting on. This was starting to feel off. I'm lost and just want to go home, he replied. This was definitely weird. I looked at him again. Then I did a double take. O-M-G. His eyes were white. Not just white around the edges, but unending white through the entire eye. No iris and no pupil, just a solid wall of light. I really don't why, but I felt myself smiling slightly as I gazed at him. Then my thoughts began to collect again. It must have been about three seconds. Oh, sorry. No kid, I have to go. I immediately regretted replying. But you have to take me, the kid replied. I don't know how, but I could feel his voice more than hear it. His words began echoing in my mind longer than it should have. 
Oh, no kid, I have to go. I started panicking. The kid replied again, this time with something indescribable behind his voice. I'm lost and just want to go home. I don't know how, but at this point it was as if someone had put the kid's voice on a loudspeaker, and as he spoke I felt as though a booming was resonating from within the kid. The force of the kid's voice was so strong. I felt strongly sympathetic to the kid, almost like I was being forced to by him. Anyway, with the last ounce of control I had left, I turned the car on and slammed on the accelerator. The kid immediately shouted out, No! Take me with you! At this point, it was as though the kid's voice was a machine gun firing into me. I immediately sped to the nearest exit in a dreamlike state and drove into the night. My friend at this point could find his own way back to his house, which he did later. While driving and exiting from the car park, I could still feel his voice within me resonating at an amplified volume. The force of his voice. It was as if I had been picked up and violently shaken by the kid whose voice was so clear and my unconscious was analyzing every nuance and inflection of what he had said like I was being forced to. There was so much force behind it. Anyway, after I got back to my apartment, I immediately tried to forget the whole thing. The next day, I'd drive to work in the normal manner, and my friend was there resentful that I had left, but we soon went back to good terms. I never did tell him or anyone else about the incident. The strangest thing did happen, however, on that same day. When I was driving back from work back to my apartment, there was a tremendous thunderstorm, and I noticed flashes, although I didn't see it, of lightning. When I was at my apartment building, I live in a complex. I opened a huge metal door to get in, and it was soaking wet. There was a handprint on it. I only noticed when I looked down to pull on the handle at about the same height. A small child would place their hand. The handprint was white, and although the whole door was dripping with water, the handprint seemed to be made of recently dried paint. I touched it, looked up, and felt it in my hand just to make sure it was painted. It was. I looked down again. The handprint within the two-second span of me sampling it and looking up had gone from white to clear. From the rain dripping on the door, I touched it again and felt it. It was painted but now completely soaked with water and far more fluid than it was before indicating it was being soaked. I looked down again. It had vanished. I put my hand on where the paint had been, but it was nothing but a metal door behind it. For some reason, I looked behind me. Of course, there was no one there. I went inside and made my way up to my apartment and had an early night. I have not encountered any white-eyed kid since or any being of supernatural type for that matter. However, I now live a slightly more cautious life than before. I have become more religious now and now, occasionally read the Bible when I didn't really believe in God before. Maybe I'll go to church. I don't know. The fact is, these creatures might actually exist and are waiting for the right opportunity to strike. One early morning, I got ready to go to the corner store before my kids had to go to school, and my wife had to go to work right after. I grabbed the keys and didn't tell my wife I was leaving, but I was sure she saw me leave and heard the keys. About ten minutes later, she texts me, but I'm already heading back, so I ignore it. As I pull up, I read one of them, and she was asking if I had left yet, and I did so. I got out the car and rushed inside to see if everything was over. She comes out asking me if I was sitting on the couch a while ago and said no, but she said she saw me on the couch sitting like I was mad and walked up to me a bit and asked if I was okay. It didn't move much or say much, but my wife was freaked out enough and went to the room waiting to see if it was going to follow her. She then looked out the window and saw I, I took her car and got even more scared, and that's when she said she texted me. I've had a few experiences as well, but those will be separate stories. Thank you for listening, and this story is very real, and hope you enjoyed it. If you are reading this, just know I know what a skinwalker is. But I really wanted to be in this group, so I added the skinny part. But I'm sure it's some kind of mimic. Thank you.
Thursday, August 17th, at around 2.30 in the morning, I believe, I woke up to this loud screeching sound. It was sharp and short. It came in intervals of four, and then would stop for about 30 seconds, and then kick up again. It did this about three times before it started to die down. Fortunately, I was able to record two of the single sounds, which I will attempt to post after this so you guys can hear it. Immediately, I sent my friend. He will remain anonymous. The audio, he's really big on this kind of stuff, and he said that the sounds were coming from a Wendigo. Obviously, I'm here almost pissing myself because the screeching woke me up, and I've never had anything like this wake me up before. I've been living in the mountains since 2019, so I've heard my fair share of animal noises, and this wasn't like anything I've ever heard before. The said friend just told me to make sure my windows are locked and keep an eye on my pets, which never leave the house anyways. I feel I should mention that I do have chickens, but they are more my stepmom's responsibility. Anyways, uh, after that I ended up reading a little on the creature and then ended up going back to sleep because at this point it was three in the morning. Even being super into the supernatural, I have never experienced their presence. It's one thing to hear stories, but being at the telling end of that story is so different. So that's really all I have to say. I guess I just need some I don't know connection. Maybe you guys can tell me about similar experiences so I don't feel so alone. And maybe you have some tips to keep myself safe. I'm not going out to poke to bear, per se, so maybe if I just leave it alone, it won't end with me. I'm on here because what I saw was odd by Malibu, Santa Monica Mountains, in a secluded beach about two weeks ago. I wanted you guys to help me narrow down which cryptid or animal it can potentially be. Anyways, the night it happened, I randomly got the chills, and I couldn't stop staring to a direction of the hills behind me, and I asked my friend if we can go home, since I had a feeling we were being watched. And he kept reassuring me nothing is going on, but still, I insisted on going home. Mm, it was 12 a.m., 1 a.m. And once we started the walk back, I saw a coyote, which didn't alarm me, since it was just one, and... I've seen them before in packs and walked right past it. What freaked me out was the thing traveling with it. Once we walked a little a while and had some distance from where we saw the coyote, I turned around and at first I didn't see it clearly in the beginning, due to it remaining in the dark, avoiding lamp posts. But whatever that thing was turned to its side. And since I was able to see the coyote next to it, by comparison, it was way larger than it. It had no hair bald. It was pale, no snout, and humanoid if that thing would stood up. I swear it would have been seven feet, eight feet. And its back wasn't completely flat like a dog. It was hunched over. I saw it having huge nails or fingers. I'm not sure, and its legs weren't dog-like, but a humanoid while it sniffed and followed us where we walked by earlier. I was so afraid because how did I not see it earlier? or even heard it since one, it was huge, and that color would stood out to me in the shrub. Another weird detail I noticed was how everything was creepily quiet. All the crickets and bugs from earlier just disappeared, and sudden mist surrounding us, even though I am fully aware on that happening being near the coastline, but it felt abnormal and just creepy. I'd like to preface by saying that I got home about an hour ago, and this actually happened. I never have paranormal encounters and genuinely try to approach everything with a questioning mind. My partner and I like to hike at a local park late at night. It's a historic park in Pennsylvania, about 3,500 acres in size, that spans over into the Maryland and Delaware borders. One of the trails allows you to cross through all three states. The entire park is mostly dense woods with a creek running through. Usually we park near an old church with a Revolutionary War cemetery that is famous for a grave known as the Ticking Tomb. 
I've been to every corner of this park, day or night. We usually hike a short loop that is roughly a half mile in length. We've walked this trail literally thousands of times and never once felt anything strange. But tonight was different. We made a spontaneous decision to go on a night hike and left the house at about 10. 45 p.m., I decided to take the narrow dirt road to our usual parking spot, rather than driving a mile up the road to a paved access road like we normally do. About halfway down the ragged dirt and gravel road as we rounded a corner, an animal dashed across the road in the path of our headlights. I've never seen anything like this animal, and I've never seen an animal that size in this area that I couldn't immediately identify. Its size was somewhere between a dog and a human, and it moved so quickly it almost looked like it flew. A literal black blur with some hazy details and bright silver eyes. My partner also saw it. I'm generally a skeptic, so I just wrote it off, and we both just kind of explained it away. We made it to our parking spot and pretty much resolved not to talk about it and continue on as usual. Immediately when we got out onto the trail, we noticed the frogs and cicadas were extremely loud, louder than I've ever heard them at night around here, as we progressed down the trail. It felt like we had to talk over the cicadas. We sort of quietly, yet frantically, attempted at lightening the mood with conversation. Unbeknownst to me at the time, about a hundred meters down the trail, my partner had begun to hear what he thought were extremely distant voices. I also noticed that the cicadas got progressively quieter the further we got down the trail. We made it about a quarter mile before a sudden louder sound felt like it cut through the space between my ears. It was something like a glitching microphone or megaphone way off in the distance. My partner pointed out to me later that there was nothing for the echo to bounce off of in that area. The moment we heard that sound, I stopped immediately and asked if he heard it too. Not only had he heard it, but he was convincing himself that he was hallucinating the sounds the entire time, until I finally acknowledged it. Without discussion, we both immediately turned around and started walking at a fast pace back to the car. I felt like it was a bad idea to run, but we had to leave right away. We hoofed it back to the car with the feeling that something was following us, all the way to the entrance. When we finally got back into the car and started driving, the feeling of urgency didn't go away. We made it all the way down the main road to our first turn, and I felt a moment of complete confusion. As I slowed to the turn, my partner asked me, Do you not know where you are right now? Because neither do I. We have literally driven this road thousands of times. I made a split-second decision to turn right, which was thankfully the right choice. The next road went along the perimeter of the park and parallel with the trail we were hiking. There was tons of fog which hadn't been there on our way in. We spent maybe 20 minutes at the park. Just as we made our way past the area that we had turned around, another animal darted across the road in front of our headlights. It looked exactly like the one we saw on our way in, only closer and in more detail. It had silver eyes and what looked like ears or horns. It was still insanely fast in either a blur or a wraith. I don't know how else to describe it. I get this really weird feeling when I think about it or talk about it. The feeling started when I saw it run across the road the second time. I feel like it's because I acknowledge that. Whatever that thing was, I couldn't explain it. I feel an almost burning sensation in my sinuses. My eyes water, and I get a strange tingling in the back of my skull. Like I said before, I'm usually a skeptic when it comes to this kind of stuff, but this experience has left me rattled. My wife walks our dogs late at night. She heard a sound and couldn't figure out where it was coming from. It was a high-pitched whining like a radio-controlled car and seemed to be coming from the graveyard near where she crosses a road. She figured an electrical box had failed and continued walking. Both dogs immediately started alerting and staring at the graveyard behind her. Then she saw the culprit, a quadcopter. 
Now remember that it was past midnight. The quadcopter didn't have any running lights, and it started to follow my wife. She was more than a bit upset, so she messaged me and asked me to be ready to drive and pick her up. The quadcopter continued to follow her and matched every turn she made. She said to me that she was scared of it knowing where we lived. She was ready to call the police when the quadcopter turned around and headed off. I drove to pick her up, and we drove out of town to approach our home from a different route. The next day, we asked the local online community groups about it. Turns out that this quadcopter had been following women to their homes for a few days. The police were notified, but the quadcopter's pilot decided to lay low, and the police couldn't find anything. We're assuming that the quad pilot saw the forum discussion about them. Sorry, it's not a Wendigo or alien, but it was creepy as hell to the people who were being followed. I have a very strange and unusual story of something we saw in Afghanistan in 2009. I was part of a small unit heading into the southernmost part of Helmand province. Afghanistan. Our primary mission was to curtail the flow of weapons coming across the border from Pakistan. To accomplish this mission, we had some DEAA guys with us as we were attempting to slow the heroin flow from Afghanistan into Pakistan. The Taliban used the profits from the heroin sales to purchase millions of dollars of munitions in Pakistan to fight the coalition. Anyway, we're on day seven of a patrol away from the war looking for some bad guys in an area near the Helmand River. There are lots of caves and ruins in that area dating back forever. It's just an extremely wild place. One August evening, a buddy and myself are on watch, just talking about what our first meal will be when we get back to the States. I look up the side of a cliff base and see movement coming from my left to my right downhill towards the river basin. I pull up my rifle and look through my ACOG scope and see a red haired large figure headed down towards a herd of goats. By this time my buddy also has his rifle shouldered and is seeing the same thing. It was the color of an orangutan, reddish orange, but was moving on two legs extremely quickly probably covering 100 meters in around 9 to 10 seconds across some rough terrain. It was also larger than a man, though I really couldn't tell you how large. It seemed as if the goats were aware of its presence, but they did not make an attempt to move away. They all just stood there in silence, staring at the thing coming down the embankment. When it reached the goats, it reached down with one arm and pulled one up by its front legs and threw it over its shoulder. It then moved to another goat, picked that one up, and threw it over the other shoulder. It then turned to start back up the cliffside with both goats in tow, and seemed to be moving just as quickly as it was when it came down, the extra weight of the goats on each shoulder not seeming to hinder it in the least. We watched it until it reached an area of known caves and disappeared. This all happened about 500 yards from our position. My buddy and I both looked at each other, and you could tell we were thinking the same thing. W-E-T-H was that. At the end of the deployment, I went in and talked to one of the environmental health guys and told him the story. Those guys are supposed to be experts on all the critters and such you may encounter when you're in the country, but he seemed to not have an answer for me. Anyway, to this day, I still have no idea what that thing was. It certainly was not a man. It was mid-December 2007 when Mom packed up me and my three younger sisters and drove us out to the family farm for a mini-vacation. The farm, as we creatively called it, was about 30 minutes outside the small Texas town of Carthage and was situated both near the Louisiana border and, and in the middle of nowhere. Sixty years ago, my great-grandparents lived in the house and had once had livestock and horses roaming the pastures. Now, after years of vacancy, it had only the echoes of its lively past. A dilapidated stable, one strong breeze from collapse. 
weather-worn chicken coops covered in creeper vines behind the barn, and a well now capped with concrete to prevent anyone from falling in. Off the winding country road and down a steep hill was the farmhouse itself, and to our collective relief it was in good order. My great-uncle made a point to drive in once a month to check on a place, and he had done so religiously for decades. We had to turn the water on when we got there and keep an eye out for snakes that might have tried to escape the cold by curling up inside the fireplace or cupboards. But other than that, it was a cozy little house. At the top of the hill was a trailer used only as secondary housing in case more than one branch of the family came down together. But it was rare anyone else ever visited. We were always alone when we came. Just us, the farm, and the woods... For those of you who don't know how big an acre is, it's close to 4,800 square yards, or about 75% of an American football field. And at 100 acres, the farm was abound with places to investigate. I often spent hours at a time wandering through the woods on my own, picking up rocks and making up adventurous stories about why I was there. As young as eight, I would go tromping around with an ancient daisy BB gun, planking trees and fence posts at my leisure. This was also the time I was taught how to handle and operate real firearms, and a few years later, at twelve, I think, I graduated to meandering around with a Marlin twenty two rifle of my own. I'd been taught not to shoot anything I would need unless it was in self-defense, but I had no desire to shoot squirrels or rabbits, even if I could eat them. I just wanted to have fun away from the suburbs I lived in, away from Mom, who treated me like I was her always, on-call babysitter, away from my sisters, who were constantly fighting and yelling about anything and everything, away from the endless monotony of school. Just get away from it all. I would wander aimlessly for hours, rifle in hand, a box of rounds jingling in my pocket, and only find my way home after the sun was beginning to set. This went on for a few more years now, an annual family tradition to make the four-hour pilgrimage to the farm during winter break. When December would roll around, I always looked forward to leaving early in the morning in my thickest coat with my marlin and not returning until I was too hungry to ignore it. But this year it was different. My great-uncle, who had owned the farm for the last thirty years, was now decrepit with age and had lost much of his memory. Knowing he was experiencing the onset of dementia, and ever the practical businessman, he passed the deed down to his two sons. They split ownership, and one of them remained in Montana, where he had a house. The other moved to the farm. When we pulled into the driveway, he was waiting for us with a wide smile on his face. He was a gruff but kind man, one who valued family above all else, and loved to engage in anything and everything he could, if it involved Ken. It was this that eventually led to the two of us at the local feed store to buy hunting licenses. He had heard from Mom how much I loved to shoot, and being a grizzled old country boy, former Marine, he simply had to take me out to bag my first deer. Fearing I would offend him if I declined his offer, I found myself up at 3 a.m. The next morning, with a beat-up old 30.30 in my hands, we hopped in his truck and moseyed through the mowed pasture straight to the tree line. He told me to hop out and handed me a flashlight. Reluctantly, I left the warm cab of the truck for below. Freezing darkness, he asked me if I knew where the leaning oak was, and of course I did. It was a tall oak tree that had grown out of the ground at a near 45-degree angle, making it relatively easy to climb. He told me to go straight to it, climb up a ways, and wait until it was bright enough to see. Only then was it legal for me to take a deer that happens through. I chewed my lip nervously, but did as he said. I had expected him to accompany me. After all, this was his idea. But once I was out, he drove back to the house for some more sleep, and I was left standing alone in the night. Everything, and I do mean everything, was pitch black like someone had poured black ink into my eyes. There was no difference between open space and tree. I might as well have been walking with my eyes closed and blindfolded. 
I inched forward slowly, terrified of how much noise my own footsteps were making. Frozen leaves crunched under my boots. Twigs snapped. In every direction I could hear movement rustling through the underbrush around me on all sides. I turned on my flashlight and immediately felt like the world was closing in on me. I was a beacon. Anything in the woods that may have wondered if something was there now knew for sure. My heart raced and I had a silent internal conflict as to whether or not I should turn the light off. I didn't like being visible. And not only that, my night vision was wrecked and would take an hour or so to acclimate, meaning I would be effectively blind after setting up in the tree. And this tree, I should tell you, is no short distance away. Even walking in a relatively straight line to it, it would take me nearly twenty minutes in daylight. But in the darkness, surrounded by watching things unseen, after what felt like a lifetime, Unsure if I was even going in the right direction, I could hear the faint trickling of running water. This had to be the small stream that bubbled past the leaning oak. I followed the noise to the water, then walked alongside it for a few minutes until, sure enough, after sliding between two trees, I came face to face with the old spot. Relief flooded through me, and I couldn't help but smile at how scared I had been. I slung the rifle over my shoulder and slowly inched my way up the tree. The bark was rough and cold beneath my shivering hands, and I continued up until I was secured in a small fork of branches. Imagine a capital I, and picture me sitting right where the limbs meet, with the two upper extensions close enough to support my back. All in all, for a tree in the middle of nowhere, it was pretty comfortable. And so I sat, arms tucked into my jacket for warmth, rifle across my lap. I tried to sleep to pass the time quickly, but the combination of cold and fear kept me wide awake. Every little noise seemed to echo off the nearly frozen trees and send icy pinpricks up my spine. I shut my eyes and pulled the drawstrings on my hood to tighten it around my face. I didn't want to disappoint my uncle by missing a shot at a deer due to sleep deprivation. Ignoring the nocturnal would be no easy feat, but I was determined to do so. That's when I heard the footsteps. They had appeared from nowhere, loud footfalls crunching the dry leaves. I froze. It was as if ice had been injected directly into my veins. My arms and legs became heavy and sluggish, my head light and eyes swimming. But my mind was racing. What could it be? It sounded big. The footsteps were slow and plodding like that of a deer or a cow or a... I couldn't bring myself to even think of the word. It just wasn't possible. It was so improbable I didn't bother to even entertain the thought. There was absolutely no way this deep in the woods in the middle of the night that I could be found by another person. The footsteps stopped directly beneath me. My muscles went rigid and I forced myself to remain still. My hands clutched the rifle so tightly I was sure there would be grooves worn into the wood. I fought the urge to turn my head and look, fought the fight, or flight response currently screaming at me to run away or shoot, or do something other than just sit there. But I didn't. I stayed where I was, quiet as the grave and still as those who enter them. Instead, I strained my ears to hear anything and everything around me. I don't know if I was assisted by the darkness, similar to the blind eventually gaining hearing above and beyond ordinary levels, but I did indeed hear something, and it made my skin crawl. Whatever this thing was, man or beast or something else entirely, was smelling me, sniffing me, breathing me in with long, heavy breaths like it hadn't had air in years. And I kid you not, it touched me with what I can only assume was some kind of snout. It brushed against my back and shoulder, pressing on my thick winter jacket. My instincts roared louder and my heart slammed against my ribs so hard I was certain this thing could hear it. Sweat ran down my neck and back in my clammy hand squeezed the rifle even tighter. And then, like the flick of a switch, it stopped. The pressure left and I heard a few steps crunching away from me. Then it was gone. No footsteps fading into the distance. No underbrush rustling as it was swept aside. No twigs snapping underfoot. Just silence. 
I gasped for air, unaware I'd been holding my breath. Shivering consumed me, but no longer due to the cold. Winter had nothing to do with the chills that racked my body in its icy wind. Couldn't touch me. I felt nothing. Nothing but the kind of dread that you know will linger. That primal fear ingrained in our DNA to be afraid of the dark and the unknown. And I was in the dark with the unknown. The rest of the night passed in a blur. I didn't move. I didn't sleep. I didn't hunt. As soon as the sun rose high enough that I could see and the sounds of those that live in the darkness was gone, I looked around for a bit, then climbed down from the tree and went straight back to the house in the most frightening and tense walk I have ever experienced. I don't know if you've ever felt the exposure that comes with being somewhere dangerous. The gut-wrenching sensation of being naked and helpless with a thousand hidden eyes following you. I do, and it sped me along until I had suddenly found myself back in the mowed pasture, back in the open where I could see far and breathe freely, back where nothing could be hiding in wait. The farmhouse stared back at me solemnly, the colors washed out in the hazy, cloud-filled sky. I wanted nothing more than to take off in a dead sprint to it where I knew there would be warmth and security. But fear still clung to me like a sickness. I rushed to the house as quickly as I could without running, for I still felt eyes boring into my back. On some level, presumably in the deepest, most primal part of my brain, I was certain that I was being stalked. My muscles ached and twitched, desperate to run. But my mind kept them in check, ordering them to go slow and show no sign of retreat, like coming face to face with a wild dog. I don't know if anything had actually followed me. It's very likely that it was all in my head after having something frighten me. And even that could have been nothing more than one of the very deer I was there to hunt. I make no claims to the contrary. After all, I did make it home safe and sound, and there have been no other sightings over ten years later. At least not that my uncle is mentioned. But it should be noted before you judge me too harshly that the spot in the leaning oak where I had sat had been measured by my uncle prior to our arrival. You see, he had plans to hang a rope ladder there for an easier way up and down when carrying a rifle. And the spot I had stayed in nestled between the boughs of those thick branches where something had not only smelled me, but also touched me, stands just over twelve feet off the ground. It was a hot summer day in 2016. I was hunting for ginseng close to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. I spent most of the day on my knees digging. About 20 minutes until night, I decided to leave, and that's when I heard the loudest scream yelling I've ever heard in my life. We have black panthers here in New River and Oak Ridge. We also have black bears, mountain lions, and massive hogs. But this was nothing I'd ever heard. I felt it in my soul. I tried to run, but I couldn't move. It's like I was in shock. Like I had just been through a shooting or a bad wreck. I was stunned. I finally made it back to my car, only to be greeted by soldiers with assault guns. They were chasing something, and they thought it was me. They quickly realized I was not as big as what they were after. My family is from the big mountains. We can walk into Kentucky from Tennessee. I've been in the woods since I was three years old, Cherokee, Irish descent. I've been aware of and taught about hairy people. My family stories were passed down to me, and I always leave them alone. They won't bother you, but the bad ones live alone and will take our women and children. My Uncle Josie, who is deceased, ran the security at the I-12 National Security Complex, and he said they killed three or four every year trying to get into the plant. The old-timers used to tell us about the time one of the hairy people came into the holler and tried to snatch up a woman. They shot it six times, and it just stood there, grabbed the girl, and left. They never saw her again. Every week, a boulder or a tree would crash through his cabin at night. This went on for a year, until they finally moved. Once, I was hunting ginseng, and then I just had this overwhelming fear come over me like somebody was watching me. I got up, 
Looked around, and out of nowhere, this head pops up from around this huge maple tree, just staring right at me. I literally wet my pants right there. I was frozen with fear. I ran almost like I was in slow motion to the car. It was running behind me and throwing rocks. I swear I've never been that scared in my life. My name is not important. I'm now a 64-year-old woman, but this happened to me when I was almost 17. I was born and raised in the country. Mom stayed at home and Dad worked in the oil fields. We lived in northern Oklahoma near the Kansas line. I had a younger sister who was a girly girl, but I was a tomboy through and through. I was the son my dad never had. He couldn't keep me inside the house. I spent my days on my horse riding many miles each day. It was my heaven on earth. Many times I'd taken after. Dark ride looking at the stars and enjoying the solitude. This particular evening I decided last minute to grab my horse and take off, probably to get away from my sister or some other teenager angst at the time. It wasn't unusual for me, you just grab a blanket only. No saddle and a halter with a head rope fashioned into the reins and take off. I always had to put a bit in my horse's mouth. Off I went in a tank top, pair of cut-off jeans, low-top converse tennis shoes, and normal summer attire. I had several dogs following along and maybe a barn cat or two for a way before they would head back to the barn. It was dark, but maybe half a moon and hardly a cloud in the sky, and down in the low 80s after a high 90-degree day. I had it out on my favorite six-mile route that took me into the pastures where a small creek snaked through the sand hills. All along the creek were large trees and bushes taking advantage of the wet areas. I had my horse in a slow rocking trot with her head down half asleep dogs panning along beside us, and me, with my head tilted back, watching an unusually active night of falling stars. All of a sudden, my horse threw up her head and did one of those dead-in-their-track stops that leave you up around their ears. I noticed her ears were straight up and staring at something. She did a quick back step or two and was shivering as if she was cold. I glanced down at my dogs, and they too were looking intently off toward the creek. That's when I looked back between my horse's ears, right where she was staring, and I saw a movement as I watched a large, hair-covered animal walking upright came into view about forty feet away. I couldn't breathe. I was so scared, I knew I was seeing something that didn't exist. It stopped in an opening between the trees and squared up to me, staring intently in my direction. It was huge, with large shoulders and long arms almost to its knees in the moonlight. I could see its hair was on the thin side, as I could see dark skin on it in several places. It stood swaying slowly, back and forth, looking at me. It lifted its head as if smelling me and stared at me, blinking its large eyes slowly. I thought it was a gorilla crossed with a caveman. About that time, one of the smaller dogs growled at the sight, and my horse did one of those nervous snorts they do. The creature turned its body back towards the creek, and in just a step or two, looked back at me and was gone out of sight. I sat there with tears running down my cheeks, finally taking a few deep breaths. I turned my horse the three miles or so back towards home, and off we went as fast as we could go, followed by a couple dogs and passing a couple who had already headed back that way. We hit the barn door, and I slid up my horse and collapsed, my legs weak with fear. I closed the doors and locked them, ran to the other end of the barn, slid the big doors shut, and suited the bar to keep them from moving. I sat there frozen with fear. Being a teenage girl that loved her horse more than I can explain in words, I was determined to keep her safe. I worried that the creature would come to get her or one of the dogs, so I sat in the barn the rest of the night. At daylight, I noticed the blanket I used to ride bareback was nowhere to be found. I had lost it somewhere along the creek. I didn't say anything to my parents. Probably out of fear they would not let me ride alone anymore or not believe me and laugh at my story.
I slept in the barn every night for weeks and feared that thing was coming to harm my animals. Every little noise would send my heart beating into overdrive. My 410-gauge shotgun was loaded and ready to protect my horse and dogs. One day, with the sun shining bright, I headed towards the creek area. We were all nervous the closer we got to the spot where I had seen this creature. I spotted my blanket where I'd nearly fallen off my horse. I quietly slipped off of her, threw the blanket on her back, grabbed a handful of mane, and jumped back on. A few steps at a time, we neared the creek until we were in the spot we had seen the creature. Since this was sand hills, there were no tracks, only large, depressed areas in the sand. The dogs are sniffing each area, all the while shivering like they were ready to cut and run, at a moment's notice. At that time, I'd seen a branch that was near the creature's head when I've seen it, and it was only a couple inches above its head while I stared at it. I rode my horse to the branch, and it was at least six inches above my head while sitting on a horse. It was fifteen hands high, and I'm five foot eight. I have no idea how tall it was, but it was enormous. After a few weeks, I stopped sleeping in the barn. I would often check on her several times a night. I kept that up for several years until she passed away, taking a piece of my heart with her. This has haunted me for the rest of my life, and not a day goes by that I don't think of it in what I saw that night. I've hunted and fished all of my life but I'm never at ease in the woods. I know what's out there. I feel like I have knowledge of something that other folks don't. I've married and divorced and had a couple children who I have never allowed to be out of my sight for any extended time. Unlike me, they never jumped on a horse and left for hours just riding to wherever their hearts desired. A couple of times while hunting, I've felt a wave of fear and nausea come over me that I hopped footed back to my vehicle, with it all in my head, or was I sensing something there? Anyway, it was a life-changing experience that has haunted me to this day. People find me hard to get close to, and I have no patience with stupidity. I now live in a city, but in the evening I can close my eyes and feel my horse underneath me, with the smells of the woods, and go back to a time before I knew that monsters are real. I'll take this to my grave, wondering what that was and why I had to see. Yet and live it and live with the knowledge that they do exist. I swear on my life that what I'm about to tell you is true. It was a night etched in my memory, haunting my dreams like a specter, refusing to be forgotten. The air inside the RV was thick with laughter and the buzz of excitement. We were a group of friends embarking on an epic road trip, the hum of the engine beneath us, and the promise of adventure ahead. Little did we know, our journey would take a sinister turn. It was on a desolate stretch of road, far from any signs of civilization, that we saw him, a hitchhiker standing on the side of the highway, a solitary figure in the moonlight, Against our better judgment, we pulled over, the screech of tires announcing our reluctant decision to welcome him aboard. As the night progressed, our mysterious passenger unfolded his dark history like a tattered map of horrors. He grew more erratic, his eyes reflecting the shadows of a past best left forgotten. Suddenly, without warning, he lunged at the driver, a frenzied attempt to take control of the wheel and send us careening into chaos. In a chaos that ensued, the driver struggled valiantly, but the air turned heavy with the scent of impending disaster. With a sudden lurch, the RV crashed, sending us sprawling into the night. Stunned and disoriented, we stumbled outside, only to find our wood, be killer, disappearing into the shroud of the surrounding woods. Fear gnawed at us as we fumbled for our phones, desperate to summon help from the authorities. Amidst the darkness, one of us saw something in the woods, a creature unlike anything we'd ever imagined, a dogman. Its eyes glowed like twin orbs of malevolence in the moonlight, towering on hind legs, covered in fur that seemed to absorb the shadows around it. The creature had the body of a man and the head of a monstrous wolf. It exuded a primal aura, 
and as it howled, the sound reverberated through the night, chilling us to the bone. Then, just as swiftly as it had appeared, the dogman vanished into the depths of the woods, leaving us trembling in its wake. By the time the police arrived, we were a jumbled mess of frantic words and terror. We recounted our harrowing experience. The crash, the attacker, and the monstrous creature that had haunted the periphery. The police, however, regarded us with skepticism. They exchanged glances as if we were a collective hallucination, dismissing our tale as the product of a wild imagination or perhaps too many hours on the road. But I swear, as sure as the moonlight that illuminated that desolate stretch of road, our encounter with the hitchhiker, the crash, and the otherworldly dogmen were not the fevered dreams of an exhausted mind. Some things, it seems, are just too dark for others to believe. My girlfriend and I had driven down an old dirt road that ran beside a lake on one side with mountains on the other. We were looking for unexplored territory to hike in. The dirt road became a trail and eventually was swallowed up entirely by the forest. Once the path became impassable by car, we got out and hiked for quite some time and began making our way back to the car as the sun was going down. It was a challenge getting the car turned around, but I finally managed and we were off. It was slow going as it was a shitty road and getting dark fast. Suddenly we came to a fork in the path that hadn't been visible coming the other way. Neither of us had any idea whether to go right or left, so I just picked randomly, hoping that both would end up taking us back to the main road. As we rounded a small curve in the road, our headlights fall upon a man dragging a large hockey duffel bag off the trail into the woods. As soon as the lights hit him, he just froze completely still. Driving past him felt like an eternity because we couldn't have been doing more than five miles an hour due to the shitty road. My girlfriend and I didn't say a word to each other until we were well past him. At which point we were like, WTF was that? And then the road ended. Just like where we had stopped the first time, the forest had swallowed up this part of the road. We were going to have to turn around and drive by the man with the human-sized duffel bag again. I told my girlfriend to buckle up and hold on tight because at the first sign of trouble I was going to gun it. We came to the spot where the man was and he was nowhere to be seen. We eventually made it to the right path and got the F out of there. The weirdest thing about it was that there wasn't a vehicle anywhere near this guy for 50 miles in either direction. We would have seen it if there had been. We'd traveled as far as possible both ways and there just wasn't a place to pull off of the road. How the hell did he get there? Where was he going? What was in the bag? On Tuesday afternoon of this week, a few minutes after six o'clock, I noticed from my window a very peculiar, solitary, vapory object in the heavens. Its position was about where the constellation of the Dipper would be at that hour, viz. due north and thirty, five degrees above the horizon. In magnitude and contour, it in a marked degree resembled a human form head, body, and nether limbs, the body and limbs robed in shadowy drapery. The head, which was of brighter luminosity on the crown and forehead, had thick flowing hair, and the whole figure was extended horizontally, with the head eastward and the front downward. But there was another feature quite as marked, and that was an appearance as of wings projecting upward and backward from the shoulders, and these in due proportional extent to the body and limbs. This last named feature gave the entirety the appearance of an angel. Flying in mid-heaven, considered as a cloud, it was remarkable that it kept the same outline continuously, which is uncommon in those vapory objects, while I had it in view for a considerable time, as it progressed swiftly toward the east. The luminosity of the shadowy angel was of a golden white, and it presented a very beautiful appearance against the blue background of the sky. 
In addition to the startling outline of the object, the interest in it was greatly increased by its being at the time the only one visible in the whole northern heavens, except some low-lying black clouds on the horizon. I called the attention of several persons to it, one of whom discovered himself the resemblance I did. Query, was this a presage of a coming event? It reminded me of the words recorded in Mark 13, 27. Then shall he send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. In those in Daniel 9, 21, Gabriel being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. I was walking through the woods after fishing for the better part of the day. I decided to stay out real late and try and fish up some bullheads from a local watering hole. I was only about 13 and stayed out way later than I normally would. Usually I would take a trail home, but decided to cut through some thicker brush to get to my grandparents' house so I could call my mom. I knew she'd probably be freaking out a bit, even though this happened from time to time. There was an abandoned graveyard on my route. I don't remember what the story was about it, but I knew it was there. I had wandered past it before. Never really checked it out. It's all overgrown and wild. I knew that if I followed on the outskirts of the graveyard, I'd hit the road and be home free. The day had been pretty chilly overall for a late spring day, but I swear in my teenage brain that it was getting colder. I remember looking at my breath and thinking it was weird how cold it had gotten. It was overall a pretty bright night near full moon, but in the woods it was hard to see. The graveyard was wide open, no trees. It was well lit. As I was walking up, I noticed that the ground was covered in a thin layer of fog and remember looking into the graveyard and not really registering what I saw at first. It was a person which at first didn't seem odd, so I kept quiet and walked into the woods a bit more. So I didn't get spotted. I didn't know who it was, so I wanted to keep clear. I stepped behind some trees and lost sight of them for a moment, and when I came back around the tree, they were gone. Weird, because I was behind the tree for maybe a few seconds tops. I didn't hear anything either. I walked a bit further, keeping an eye out. I was a bit creeped out. Near the graveyard was a run-down. Barn, I'm not really sure, but as I got closer to it, I could see that someone was inside. I got a good look, and it was a woman, probably in her fifties. The way the moonlight hit her made her look incredibly pale. She seemed to be digging, but I didn't hear anything. No sounds of a shovel or her making noise in any way. I was maybe thirty feet away. I could see she stopped and disappeared behind some debris. I decided to get the heck out to there and quickly moved to get out to the road. I tried to keep track of her looking for where she went, but I couldn't find her. It was like she'd literally disappeared. I kept trucking and came out to the road. The fog was pretty much covering the road. A small country road, fields on one side, woods on the other. As I walked down the road, she would randomly appear behind and in front of me, and I started hiding and basically playing cat and mouse. Each time I saw her, she was hard to see, only in the moonlight and stuck to the remnants of some of the old houses nearby. She always looked pale, never made any noise. Once I got past that part of the road, we did a number of barn foundations and home remnants. I never saw her again, and it instantly started getting warmer. Creep me the heck out, and I never went that way again. I don't know who or what that was, but I told my uncle about it, and he went and checked it out, thinking maybe someone was maybe trying to excavate the graves. He said there wasn't anything messed with. They thought I was lying. Still gives me the shakes just typing this out. I know it was most likely someone wandering around looking for stuff or checking the place out, but what teenage me remembers didn't seem natural. It was also weird that she never made noise. She also seemed to be able to just appear and move around me. At one point, she was right behind me, and I swear a moment later she was in front of me. One day last week, a marvelous apparition was seen near Coney Island. 
at the height of at least a thousand feet in the air. A strange object was in the act of flying toward the New Jersey coast. It was apparently a man with bat's wings and improved frog's legs. The face of the man could be distinctly seen, and it wore a cruel and determined expression. The movements made by the object closely resembled those of a frog in the act of swimming with his hind legs and flying with his front legs. Of course, no respectable frog has ever been known to conduct himself in precisely that way. But were a frog to wear bat's wings and to attempt to swim and fly at the same time, he would correctly imitate the conduct of the Coney Island monster. When we add that this monster waved his wings in answer to the whistle of a locomotive and was of a deep black color, the alarming nature of the apparition can be imagined. The object was seen by many reputable persons, and they all agree that it was a man engaged in flying toward New Jersey. About a month ago, an object of precisely the same nature was seen in the air over St. Louis by a number of citizens who happened to be sober and are believed to be trustworthy. A little later, it was seen by various Kentucky persons as it flew across the state. In no instance has it been known to alight, and no one has seen it at a lower elevation than a thousand feet above the surface of the earth. It is without a doubt the most extraordinary and wonderful object that has ever been seen, and there should be no time lost in ascertaining its precise nature, habits, and probable mission. That this aerial apparition is a man fitted with practicable wings, there is no reason to doubt. Someone has solved the problem of aerial navigation by inventing wings with which a man can sustain himself in the air and direct his flight to any desired point. Who is this adventurous flyer and what is his object are questions of immediate and enormous importance. Of course, the first impulse of the unreflecting mind will be to exclaim that the mysterious flyer is an aeronaut who has invented practicable wings and is secretly experimenting with them before making his invention public. This is directly at variance with the known habits and customs of aeronauts. Had any aeronaut invented a pair of wings he would have advertised long before his invention was perfected that he was in possession of a machine wherewith to make an aerial voyage to Europe in 24 hours, and that he was prepared to exhibit it for a few weeks to everyone who would pay 50 cents to see it a little later. He would have taken up a subscription to pay the expenses of his proposed voyage in the interest of science, and would probably have published a book on the science of aeronautics. Then he would have suddenly disappeared, taking his wings with him, or accidentally burning them, and after the first outburst of indignation on the part of a swindled public would have been totally forgotten. This has been the invariable practice of these ingenious aeronauts who have claimed to be the inventors of balloons or other apparatus capable of navigating the air. That the mysterious flying man has not followed this custom makes it perfectly clear that he is not a professional aeronaut. Beyond any question, either the flying man or some scientific person at present unknown has invented the bat's wings and frog's legs with which the flying man now sails through the air. Why has not the inventor patented his invention and had himself duly written up by the press? The reason is obvious. The flying man is engaged in some undertaking which he cannot safely proclaim. In other words, he is an aerial criminal, a fact which explains the cruelty and determination visible on his countenance. And what can be the nefarious object which this probable wretch has in view? It cannot be simply theft and robbery, for it would manifestly be impossible for him, in his flying costume, to perpetrate burglary or highway robbery, or to pick pockets. It cannot be plumbing, for obvious reasons. Neither can it be the sale of books published by subscription only. Yet the flying villain must have an object, and we have a right to assume that only a peculiarly nefarious object could induce a man to fly to New Jersey or St. Louis in hot weather, and without an umbrella or mosquito net. It has not escaped notice that of late Mr. Talmadge has been wandering in the West in search of entertaining varieties of crime wherewith to embellish his sermons. 
It is also known that he returned to this city just before the flying man of Coney Island was seen. Now, if there is a man in this country whose arms and legs are fitted to endure the muscular strain inseparable from the act of flying, that man is Mr. Talmadge. He has preached for years with those graceful limbs and must have developed and hardened their muscles to an extent which would fill every other professional acrobat with envy. What is more probable than that Mr. Talmage has equipped himself with wings in order to study interesting types of immorality from the lofty height of a thousand feet? He has flown over St. Louis and Kentucky, precisely the places which might be expected to yield a rich reward to an investigator of crime, and he is now flying to and fro over Coney Island, preparatory to preaching a scathing sermon on the wickedness and indecencies of our bathing resorts. Here we have a natural and probable explanation of the flying man, and it is earnestly to be hoped that no one, with mistaken zeal for field sports, will attempt to shoot the preacher on the wing with a shotgun. There is not a shot gun in existence which will do any good at a distance of a thousand feet. When I had 16 years old, I was in my friend's house watching a movie, and after I come back to my house, walking on the street normally, was 1.30 a.m. when I arrival at my house. I gone to my room and go front the mirror. I didn't turn on the light in this moment. I used my phone's flashlight. So in this exactly moment, I saw a pale man behind me with straight black hair looking at me for three, five seconds, and I could felt my skin creeps like never before in my whole life. I was so scarred with this, I couldn't sleep well in this night. I had overthinking in this thing for a few years, but couldn't found something about it. I don't. What is it? On September 18th, an unsettling incident unfolded involving my dad's friend and a terrifying creature known as the Dogman. This creature had brutally killed his 130-pound dog. The dog had a poignant backstory as it was a gift from his wife's late uncle. Before his passing, the uncle had entrusted her with a dog and she had promised to care for it. One night, the dog's instincts kicked in, sensing a looming danger. It began barking incessantly, indicating a perceived threat. Despite their efforts, the dog managed to escape from their home. Tragically, the following morning revealed a grim sight. The lifeless body of the dog lay on their porch, its entrails savagely torn apart. In response, Justin, the dad's friend, moved the dog's remains to another location, intending to return later to bury it. However, upon his return, he was met with confusion and disbelief. The dog's body had disappeared without a trace. Seeking answers, he reviewed the footage from his trail camera and was met with a chilling revelation. The camera had captured images of the dogman itself. Unfortunately, I don't possess the actual pictures of the dogman. The incident left Justin's wife profoundly distraught grappling with the loss of their beloved pet in the unsettling encounter with the enigmatic dogman. I've lived in Florida almost my entire life, and right now I live in central Florida, so this is terrifying. When I was about eight, we rented a place that was on one of the main streets of our town. Without being too specific, this was in Pinellas County, my brother and I would walk our dog down the main road, and occasionally we would see a dead animal. We would just assume that it was roadkill from the night before. It was always opossums and raccoons. So this was the most logical conclusion. This went on for weeks, maybe months. As time went on, there were more and more dead animals, and we noticed they were always in one yard. As time went on, we noticed the animals got more and more exotic. For example, one time, there was a dead snapping turtle. This would not have been roadkill in the area because there wasn't water around this specific area, and we had never seen this type of turtle nearby. So whoever lived there had been slowly collecting more dead animals as time went on. It was freaky shit, especially for an eight and six-year-old.
We eventually told our parents and some other family, and my grandma brushed it off by saying that in her old neighborhood, people would nail dead animals to trees. So this wasn't a big deal. Still weird and oddly out in the open on this large road. It is still creepy to think that this was going on so close to home. And now, after your story, the feeling is back. One time on a scout camp when I was around 14, we were finishing up an activity late at night and hiking back to our site. The leader of our group, no adults mind you, had the map and instructed us to make a turn into a secluded part of the forest where we walked for a good 20 minutes without reaching any sort of destination. Just as we were about to turn back, someone pointed out that there was a tree stump that looked like a massive dog laying down about 100 meters away. Jokingly, one of my friends at the time started howling like a wolf as a sort of mock communication with the perceived dog. And by God Almighty, did it scare the living shit out of me when I thought I saw its eyes open and glint back at me, then sit up, then stand and start slowly walking towards us. At this point, we froze, all losing our shit in all senses of the phrase, and tried to ignore it in the hopes that it would be fooled into thinking that we were trees or something. Isn't that what it's meant to make dogs think? Still, it came closer to us, creeping slowly, calculated as if it could jump at any moment. We stood there as a group of five or so not so brave now. Boy Scouts panicking and trying to figure out what the hell we should do, whispering as quietly as possible about whether to make a bolt for it as the canine figure was around 40 meters away from us now. I was beginning to make out more detail, a very long jaw that hung half open, big paws that stepped with visible agility and power, a rather large figure around the size of a Siberian husky, Someone suggested running back while we still had the distance, and in our unease, we chose this option quickly and bolted as fast and as hard as we could. With quite literally every fiber of my being, I was propelling myself forward as fast as I could, regretting not exercising more and wondering how we would fare should we be unable to outpace the beast. No sooner had we sprinted for around two minutes that we had turned a large bend and checked behind us to see if there was anything that could potentially spell our impending doom, which there wasn't, thankfully. I was rather confused at this stage. Why didn't it chase after us? Perhaps it was roped to a tree as someone pet, or it was old and couldn't keep up. Either way, we all tried to laugh it off and were just about to check the map to recorrect our route back, both to get some rest and to tell the story of how we all nearly died. To our other friends and leaders, when we heard the rapid scraping of paws on gravel and turned to see that the animal had decided to follow us and continue the hunt. I don't think I had ever run so fast in my entire existence before this point, but holy shit. I was so goddamn scared at how fast that dog ran at us. We all bolted as fast as we could for the turnoff and headed towards our camp, maintaining the ludicrous speed that was becoming all the more crucial. As the dog approached us, we reached the turnoff and found that it was a steep uphill slog, because of course it would be. Continuing up the hill at breakneck speed, we were all running for our lives and all contemplating the meaning of it simultaneously. Just as we reached the top of the incline, we heard a sharp whistle call from a long way back and noticed a figure standing in a sort of lumberjack-looking outfit at the bottom of the hill. The dog pulled a complete 180 immediately and left us to our thoughts after that. One of the adults at our campsite found the man later and spoke to him about what had happened. Apparently the dog was trained to retrieve hunted animals and... As such figured, we were a target, and so pursed us as a target. Probably one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me as a kid. This occurred on June 17, 2015. It was a sunny day at around mid-afternoon while we were boating along the eastern shore of Lake George, New York. We were just above the Narrows. 
about 140 yards away from the shore. When the sighting occurred, the shoreline of this section of the lake is state property in the part of the forever wild section of the Adirondack. There are many square miles of wilderness here, and this location is only about eight miles from the locally famous Whitehall, New York sightings in 1976. We are motoring in our 19-foot outboard boat northeast in a narrow channel between some islands and the mainland. Our intended goal was a small single-site camp a short distance away. We're traveling about five miles per hour, slightly above idling speed. As we cleared the channel, there's a bay on our starboard side. Since I'm always scanning the water to the side looking for boat traffic, I was looking east into the bay and I noticed movement close to the shoreline. It seemed that whatever it was that we caught it by surprise. As we cleared a point of land, I got my wife's attention. She looked in that direction, also saw it. My view was of a very large, glossy, black animate being that was squatted down by the water and seemed to quickly raise an arm from its side to a horizontal position. It rose up and then turned away and moved back to the side. It moved behind a nearby clump of coniferous trees. I couldn't believe how fast it moved. I then spun the boat around for a better view. Meanwhile, my wife was watching it. Her impression was that it was large, dark, and upright, and moved like an animal. Her view was slightly restricted by the trees that it was hiding behind, but she did notice that the being was swaying from side to side. The only known animal that is large and black out here in the Adirondacks is a black bear. We both strongly know it wasn't a bear. We can't provide any accurate dimensions or descriptions of any physical details, but even though we're not sure of what it was, we're sure of what it was not. We're used to seeing people on the shore, and this being was far larger than any human. We had cameras and binoculars aboard, but we're trying to process what we saw and never thought to grab either of them. It happened that fast. We then continued on to the island, which is about 200 yards from the sighting and only about 20 feet from the mainland. We chatted for a bit about what we just saw. Eventually, we got the charcoal grill fired up and proceeded to cook a meal. We do this on a regular basis on the islands. As we're eating, all of a sudden, I had a strong feeling to leave now. I shared that with my wife, and we quickly finished our meal, loaded the gear back on the boat, and left. I was not afraid, mind you, but I experienced a strong sense to leave. I knew we had to get out of there. I've never had that type of experience on the lake or anywhere else before, and I'm not sure the two events are related. I suspect that it wanted us to go away and go away now. Since then, I've had a heightened awareness of their presence in the woods and have found dozens of tree breaks and have recorded howls and wood knocks. On one occasion, while we were hiking in the fall, we noted a tree break at our destination and made a big deal about it. You can only imagine, to our surprise, as of a return down the same trail, that something had bent and splintered a four-inch living hardwood right over the trail. It was not that way on the way up. We did not feel afraid, but something was clearly communicating to us that it was the baddest thing around. My story is short and takes place many years ago when I was a kid in the early 1980s living in southeast Missouri. My parents and the neighbors were hanging out having a few Miller lights in the neighbor's yard and we kids were playing. It was shortly after dark when we decided to play tag. For those of us that have actually gone outside to play in the suburbs know that this is a perfect time to play this game. My neighborhood was like most, I guess, but my neighborhood was near a creek that ran for miles and passed by several thick stands of trees. So we'd been playing a while when I ran away from whomever it was that was it. It was at that moment when I saw something, a huge, almost glowing white shape, walking between two trees in the yard in front of me. It looked like a mixture of the Patterson, Gimlin, Bigfoot, and one of those costume villains from Scooby-Doe. It quickly passed behind a tree and was gone. It didn't reappear on the other side. I was so shocked and 
terrified that I couldn't take my eyes off where it had been. Then I ran straight into another tree, knocking myself silly. After the excitement of me hurting myself was over, I told my brother about it, and he, like everyone else I've told since, thought the same thing, that I had imagined it due to nearly knocking myself out. But I know what I saw, and that I saw it before I hit the tree, and to this day, I can still see it in my mind as clearly as I did that late summer evening. I've gone on to call whatever I saw, Bigfoot's ghost. I live in Ohio in a Cleveland suburb. This occurred in January 2023. At 1 a.m. I woke up and was very disoriented as well as sick to the stomach. It took me a good hour to fall back to sleep. Over the rest of the day, I had multiple unexplained bizarre sightings and apparitions. At 7 a.m. I wake up for a morning shower with the intention of going to work. It is still very dark and I spot a creepy dark figure moving across my back porch. It was approximately three feet in size. I was so frightened by the figure that I locked myself in my basement. No windows or ways to peek in. Around 7.30 a.m., I hear unexplained noises, anywhere from a banging to a boom. Then a loud ringing in only one ear. Early that afternoon, I decided it was safe to leave and drove to a friend's house on the outskirts of the city. As I was driving, I saw a large diamond, shaped light, come from a patch of woods. The light started to fade, and I could spot movement towards the car. It was a triangular craft with a dark graphite, like texture and color. The object moved away from the car and disappeared into the woods. I soon arrived at my friend's, and we talked about the strange appearances. By the time I left around 4 a.m. the next morning, my friend and I arrived at my home at 4.30 a.m. Well, that little pygmy figure appears again at 7 a.m. right on the dot. My TV goes crazy. The only thing that happens from then on is us getting in my car, driving two miles out of town, stopping, vomiting, and proceeding to the nearest church we can find. I speak to the pastor at the church at 8 a.m., and he tells me bad things are associated with my house. But this did not convince me. So here I am, writing to you, looking for some sort of explanation to these frightening appearances. I have seen the little being twice since. Is this only the beginning of these odd appearances? I pray I never see the dark, creepy thing on my back porch ever again. As the sun cast long shadows across the Arizona landscape, I found myself in a remote forest determined to make the most of my solo hunt for pheasants. The rustling leaves and chirping birds created a symphony of nature, and the anticipation of a successful hunt surged through me. The forest felt alive, vibrant, and full of potential. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the canopy grew denser, blocking out more and more of the sunlight. The air grew cooler, and the silence was almost overwhelming, save for the occasional snap of a twig beneath my boots. My heart pounded with a mix of excitement and trepidation. It was as if I had entered a different world, one untouched by time and human influence. I followed a narrow path that seemed to have been carved out by the passage of animals. The path twisted and turned, and at times I had to crouch beneath low-hanging branches. It was then that I noticed a peculiar movement ahead caught by the corner of my eye. As I advanced cautiously, the sounds of nature were replaced by a strange, hushed stillness. My steps grew slower as I caught sight of the creatures in the distance. My eyes widened in both awe and confusion. There they were, two creatures unlike anything I had ever seen before. The larger one, about seven to eight feet tall, was covered in light beige hair. It stood with its back to me, reaching for a branch about fifteen feet off the ground. Its movements were deliberate, almost human-like, and a sense of primal curiosity washed over me. The smaller creature, only about three feet tall, mirrored the larger one's appearance, covered in hair with the exception of its hands, feet, and around its eyes. This one had a darker shade of beige hair, and it was bent over, 
struggling to pick up a stick and put it in its mouth. The sight was utterly surreal, like stumbling upon a page from a storybook that had been lost to time. The hair on both creatures was thick, their appearance wild and untamed, as if they had emerged from the heart of the forest itself. I squinted, trying to make out the details of their faces, but their features remained largely obscured. The large creature's body was robust and powerful, its form shrouded in a cloak of mystery. My hunting instincts kicked in, and I shouldered my rifle with a practiced ease. I aimed carefully, focusing on the larger creature's back. The trigger was pulled, and the shot echoed through the woods. I watched as the bullet streaked toward its target, only to miss by a hair's breadth. To my astonishment, neither creature flinched at the sound of the gunshot. They seemed to be in a world of their own, completely unaffected by my presence. As the creatures continued their activities, seemingly unfazed, my mind raced to make sense of the situation. What were these creatures? Were they a new species? Or perhaps some forgotten legend brought to life? Doubt and wonder clouded my thoughts, leaving me hesitant to take another shot. Eventually, the creatures melted back into the forest, disappearing as mysteriously as they had appeared. I stood there, my heart pounding in my chest, the echoes of my missed shot fading into the distance. The forest around me returned to its usual symphony, as if it had absorbed the creatures into its evergreen embrace. When I returned to my friends, they bombarded me with questions about my hunt. They were eager to hear about my experiences, the game I had encountered, and my shots fired. But I remained silent, lost in my thoughts. How could I explain what I had witnessed? How could I convey the profound sense of wonder and bewilderment that had washed over me in those quiet woods? Instead of sharing my story, I simply smiled, my mind a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. Some mysteries are best left untouched, nestled within the heart of the forest waiting for those rare moments when the boundaries between reality and the unknown blur, leaving us forever questioning what lies beyond. When I was a kid, like I was 11 or 12, something like that, I was playing in the huge parking lot that was behind my house in North Chicago, Illinois. I had a baseball bat, and I was pretending it was a sword. So I was in the parking lot, slashing around, pretending I was fighting bad guys. The parking lot was one huge parking lot, and then it had driveways going beside the building, out to the main road. So I was fighting in it, and I got up to the fence that was on the side of one of the driveways, and I did a fancy little slash, and then I pretended I sheathed it on my back, and then I stood up and I looked down the driveway. I saw myself standing on the sidewalk, staring back at me. Of course, I was freaked out because I didn't know what was going on. At first, I thought it was someone who looked just like me, and he probably thought the same thing. And then he kind of did a jog down the sidewalk past the building where I couldn't see him anymore. So I ran up and looked around the corner, and he was gone. I looked around the parking lot just in case he was looking for me, but I couldn't see him. So, creeped out, I decided to head home, and I told my father about this, and then in, he told me about doppelgangers. I was convinced I saw my own doppelganger. Two or three years later, I'm walking down the sidewalk toward home, and I look down the driveway, and I see myself playing in this parking lot, doing all the same slashes. I did like the fancy slash and sheathed it, and I was like, I, I remember this. I remember seeing myself in this position, so without even thinking about it, I dashed off to the front of the building and turned around and I waited for my younger self to come up the driveway. But my younger self never showed up. I looked down the driveway and I was not there. I walked home and I told my father about what I just saw and he laughed. I wonder if seeing a doppelganger is common. My father acted as if it was something that happens to everyone. I'm an adult now, and it's been over a dozen years since that last encounter. I'm just wondering what caused me to see it. There's a story I've been wanting to tell for a while now that happened to me some years ago. 
thinking back, it gives me the chills. For the sake of anonymity for those involved, I've changed our names, but the dates are accurate. For clarity's sake, I'm not a believer in the paranormal or the supernatural or any myths and legends. I'm still not sold on what happened, but it's creepy enough when I consider all the facts. I do apologize for the length, but I want to get all this out in one fell swoop. You see, my cousins live back in northern Wisconsin, the rural part where houses are surrounded by miles of wood, and the roads are dirt and gravel. Not that they're out in the boonies or anything. The main town, though small, is only about five miles down the highway from where they live. My uncle, let's call him Kurt, he's the local sheriff of the area and so has lots of interesting stories to tell. My cousins, having grown up in these woods, are expert hunters and fishermen. They've hunted at all hours of the day in all kinds of weather and have tracked anything from deer and pheasants to bears. What I'm trying to say is they don't scare easy. Neither do their hunting dogs, two black Labradors called Magic and DJ. I've never been easy to scare either. No has my brother, but what we experienced was enough to give us all the heebie-jeebies. Even ten years later, remembering these events is enough to give me chills. There had been strange occurrences over the years, none of which my brother nor I were aware of until we visited them one summer, back in 2006. Now, my mom, my brother, and I usually visited them for at least a week or two every year up until Rob, who was three years older than my brother, left for college. We never experienced anything out of the ordinary until that year and haven't experienced anything since. What happened, though, has stayed with us all. My brother Mike and I weren't made aware of these happenings until we'd experienced enough to convince Uncle Kurt to share what he knew. Rob and Sam, who was one year older than me and a year younger than Mike, also chipped in with their own experiences. I'm chronicling our tales here in order as best as I can remember. 1998. Rob was about seven years old at this time. One night, he snuck into the backyard to play on the old swing set they had set up. My cousin's backyard is surrounded by an eight-foot-high chain-link fence to keep bears and other predators out, and to keep the kids in. After swinging for a few minutes, Rob said he remembered hearing the most horrible noise he's ever heard, like something out of a horror movie. It was a distant roar, like some kind of huge beast, deep and brassy with an animalistic rumble, but at the same time screechy, like fingernails on a blackboard. Terrified, Rob fled back inside, screaming for his parents. They, apparently, had slept through the noise and had only awoken when they heard Rob scream, approximately 2005. Kurt was finishing his patrol one night when he received a call from dispatch. Apparently, a local man had left his home early that morning to go fishing at one of the many lakes around town, promising his wife to be back around lunchtime. When he still hadn't returned by evening, his wife worriedly called the police. Once informed of which lake he'd gone to, Kurt and a couple squad cars headed to the narrow dirt trail that led off from the highway. It was a small turnoff, easy to miss if you didn't know it was there, surrounded on both sides by dense foliage and trees. It took maybe ten minutes to get from the highway to the lake, as you had to drive very slowly on the dirt path to avoid potholes, branches, and occasionally animals that may be in the road. After a few minutes on the trail, the officers came upon the man's car, spun out from the trail and smashed against a tree several feet into the woods. The entire passenger side was caved in, as if something had rammed into the car at high speed and shoved it into the tree. There was blood and tufts of hair all over the inside of the car and the driver's seat. Belt was ripped out of the buckle and the windshield was completely gone. It was as if the man had been wrenched through the windshield and dragged away, but the police couldn't find any trail even after bringing in canines. The only evidence pointing towards an animal attack rather than a murder was a set of claw marks gouged into the metal hood of the car. Experts determined it must have been a very angry bear, but no bears had been sighted, let alone reported, during that season. The man's body never turned up. 
August 9, 2006. Sam and Mike, on the second night we were visiting, decided to try camping out in the backyard. Despite the fence, our aunt insisted they take at least one of the dogs into the tent with them just to be safe. So they took Magic, the older lab. Magic had been very well trained and was usually very quiet, but sometime in the middle of the night she became incredibly agitated. She began barking quietly at first, but soon much louder. This is when Sam and Mike woke up. They told me that Magic would bark for several seconds, then fall quiet, not even growling, then start barking again. After repeating this several times, the two of them started hearing rustling from somewhere beyond the fence. They were camped somewhat near the house, so whatever was capable of making that much noise had to be huge. They stayed quiet, Sam warning Mike that if it was indeed a bear, any sudden movement might cause it to charge, and that fence wouldn't keep it out for long. However, despite Magic's ferocious barking, the rustling kept getting louder. Just as Sam was about to take the flashlight to try and see anything, our Aunt Kelly opened the side door and bellowed at Magic to shut up. Kelly, despite being a relatively frail woman, was incredibly loud and forceful, to the point that even Magic was somewhat scared of her. Apparently, whatever was in the woods was too, because the rustling soon faded and Magic fell quiet. Neither Sam nor Mike were able to fall asleep again because a couple hours later the rustling started again. Magic didn't make any more noise, but she stayed on high alert, standing stiff with her tail between her legs, staring at the front of the tent. Sam said the rustling would die down occasionally, then start up from a different direction, as if whatever was out there was circling the house and trying to bait someone to come out. Around four in the morning, completely exhausted, Sam and Mike finally drifted off. When Kurt came outside around seven to wake them, he sounded strange, as Sam put it. When the two of them climbed out of the tent, they saw why. A section of the fence had been bent at the top, peeled outward as if something had grabbed it and tried to pull it down. Not even a bear would have been tall or brave enough to do this. Needless to say, they packed up the tent and slept inside for the rest of the visit. August 10, 2006 after the initial scare of the previous night had passed and Kurt spent the day patrolling the woods around the house for several hundred yards in all directions with both Magic and D.G., he determined whatever had visited the night before was gone. That evening, Mike and I were invited to paintball with Kurt, Sam, and Rob for a few hours. Being hunters, the three of them were very good at this, and Mike and I both had minimal experience. I declined, preferring to stay on the balcony and do some target practice with my other cousin, Claire, who is two years younger than me. The four of them disappeared into the woods, and soon all we heard was the popping of the paintball guns and the occasional shout of joy or pain whenever one of them pegged another. Now I heard and saw nothing, but when Kelly cut the game short a couple hours later when she called for Kurt to help her clean up after DJ threw up all over the carpet, Mike went directly up to me and told me something that chilled me to the bone. At one point in the game, he'd been trying to circle behind Rob to peg him a good one when he saw movement out of the corner of his eye. Thinking it had been Sam or Kurt, Mike had crouched in a bush as the thing approached. As it got closer, he decided it was Kurt since the shape appeared to be very tall. Kurt is six foot four and took aim. However, as it continued to approach him, Mike noticed it appeared to be wearing something shaggy akin to a ghillie suit, and it took him a second to realize that none of them were wearing anything that resembled that. For those of you who don't know, ghillie suits are those shaggy camouflage uniform soldiers wear to disguise themselves among bushes. Unnerved, Mike was debating on whether to shoot at it or not when he heard Kelly calling. As Sam, Rob, and Kurt began making their noisy way back towards the house, the shape disappeared back into the darkness. He didn't bring this up with the others until we sat down and talked about all of this, and it seriously freaked out Rob, Sam, and Kurt since they hadn't seen or heard anything that night. August 11, 2006, Kurt decided to take us fishing at, you guessed it, the same lake. He was not superstitious in the least, and neither were any of us. 
So despite the creepy encounters over the past couple of days, we were willing to chalk it up to wild animals and Mike and me not being used to the woods. So the six of us hitched up the boat trailer, piled into Kurt's truck, and headed out. The lake was maybe a 20-minute drive from the highway, not including the time it took to meander from the house to the highway and the highway to the lake. When we finally made it to the turnoff, Kurt drove very slowly as the rain from the past few weeks had made the path very treacherous and full of hidden bumps and ditches. Even going as slow as 10 miles per hour, the car bumped and jostled us enough to make our butts sore. Rob and Sam, ever the trackers, were leaning out of the side windows to try and spot any tracks. In case they wanted to come back sometime later for hunting, they noted, but didn't mention until later, that all the tracks they saw seemed to be heading away from the lake. When we finally arrived, we split up. Rob, Sam, and Mike climbed into the smaller rowboat and headed off towards the other end of the lake. The lake itself was shaped like an uneven U, the main part being quite large, with the smaller part disappearing around a bend and ending at a natural beaver dam. All in all, it takes maybe half an hour to row from one end to the other. While the boys were off doing their own thing, Kurt, Claire, and me jumped into the slightly larger motorboat and hung around the main section of the lake. Fishing was relatively good, as between the three of us over the course of several house, we managed to catch seven or eight decent-sized fish. Nothing strange had happened up until the sun was just starting to set and we were casting our last few lines. At this time, I caught something truly massive on my line and attempted to reel it in with all I had. Being twelve at the time, I had very little arm strength, but I was determined to at least see what I'd caught. Kurt stepped in to help haul it up, thinking I'd either hooked a log or even a muskie, which is like a freshwater barracuda, quite strong and with nasty needle teeth. Google it if you want which were known to be in the lakes around the area. As a precaution in case this happened, all of our rods were strung with dragon line, made especially for fishing in musky territory, as it was strong enough that they wouldn't snap the line while struggling on the hook. With Kurt's help, I managed to haul whatever was hooked almost to the surface. The lake water was relatively murky, so visibility faded after the first foot or so, but even then, the three of us saw something very, very big rising to the surface. At this point, Kurt was convinced it was a muskie, as the line was jerking back and forth, and a log certainly wouldn't be able to do that. When the shape was maybe four feet from the surface, the line suddenly pulled so sharply I nearly lost my grip on my pole. The top foot of the pole dipped into the water almost straight down as the thing dove, and then, before the rod had a chance to break or be ripped from my hands, the line snapped. That's right, it snapped. The ricochet was almost enough to send me over the other side of the boat, but luckily Claire was there to catch me. Unnerved but not wanting to end the day just yet, Kurt trimmed the line and gave me a new setup. The next thing that happened was soon after when Kurt hooked a particularly large bass on a five-hook lure. While attempting to remove the hooks, the fish was flopping so much that one of the stray hanging hooks caught Kurt's thumb and gave it a pretty nasty slice. Luckily, he packed first aid supplies in the tackle box for accidents just like this. But when he dripped antiseptic on the cut, he held his hand over the side of the boat, letting the blood dribble into the water. After a few minutes, Claire pointed out a trail of bubbles and ripples on the surface of the water some yards out. It circled our boat slowly a couple times, but soon disappeared. As the sun was now setting enough that Kurt decided to call it a day, he motored us back to the shore, and we hitched up the boat to the trailer. While Kurt packed the fishing rods and strung the fish on a line to keep them from flopping out of the truck bed, Claire and I went back down to the shallows to look for frogs as we waited for the boys to return from the other side of the lake. Suddenly we heard frantic shouting from the other side of the lake. Claire and I looked up to see the boys' boat quite literally skimming the water as they blew around the bend and gunning it straight for the shore. I remember thinking since when did they have a motor on that boat because Rob was rowing so fast. Sam was shouting at us to get away from the water so they could land the boat 
and moderately freaked out at their desperation, Claire and I promptly complied. In doing so, however, I tripped over an old campfire and ended up with a giant log pinning my foot down. Claire wasn't strong enough to lift the log, and by this time the boy's boat had reached the shore in record time. Now, my brother wasn't exactly the strong type either, being only 14, but as soon as the boat hit the sand, he leapt out and dragged it up the embankment single, handed, with Rob and Sam still sitting in it. Once the boat was entirely out of the water, Sam jumped out and managed to lift the log clear off my foot while Rob helped Mike and Kurt hitch up their boat. I've honestly never seen any of them more frantic and unnerved, and it scared me. Even Kurt, who didn't fully understand their panic, got the message enough to book it out from the lake. Normally calm and collected, he took the trail much too fast, and at several points we were afraid he'd break the hitch and we'd lose the boats. At this time, the sun had fully set behind the tree line, and it was unsettlingly dark inside the dense foliage. Rob kept turning to look behind us to make sure the boats were still hooked up. But it wasn't until later that I realized he was also keeping an eye out for anything else. The rest of us were looking forward, trying to spot the highway, so Rob was the only one to attest to this. But he swears up and down that right as the trail opened onto the highway shoulder, and we exited the woods, he saw a huge and hairy arm swing out towards the boat as if trying to grab the fish we'd left in the bottom with the tackle gear. He said it was thick and heavy like a bear's arm, but the elbow was all wrong and it was much too long and high off the ground. He didn't mention this to any of us until several days later when Mike and I were packing up to head back home. When questioned later as we prepared the fish for dinner, Sam explained that they'd been exploring the lake for a while. At the very end of the inlet was a huge beaver dam that had been there for quite some time and they wanted to show Mike what it looked like. When they arrived, however, the dam was demolished. It looked like something very large and very strong had decided to use the logs as scratching posts. Weirded out, they decided to not get any closer and headed back towards the bend before dropping anchor. As the sun began to set and they were finishing up with their last few catches, Mike had hooked a bass right in the eye. It bled all the way up to the surface and all over the boat as they took the hook out. They washed the blood out as best they could and prepared to pack up when they noticed the same bubble and ripple trail Claire and I had seen, heading straight for them. Now seriously freaked, Rob had grabbed the oars without another word and booked it back to shore. Between that day and the day we left, the three of them had slowly told Mike and me the previous incidents and encounters, but at this point I had been sure they were just trying to freak us out as a going, away present. Kurt finished off our trip by telling us of a local urban legend, one he was convinced we'd encountered for real. Keep in mind, what I'm writing here is from memory and what Kurt told us, so if there are any inaccuracies with geography or historical evidence, that's on him. In his words, the story begins over 200 years ago. A wagon train full of settlers headed west got lost and turned around in winter snowstorms. Instead of following their path, the settlers ended up going north. They came upon a small lake in the middle of northern Wisconsin and decided to make camp there, hoping to ride out the rest of the winter storms, rather than risking continuing and getting more lost. They didn't make it, and their story was forgotten for a century before prospective hunters and fishermen came upon the lake, hoping for a good place to stake out for the season. After exploring and doing some digging into what appeared to be an old, abandoned campsite, they found the remains. The majority of what they found were animal bones, oxen and horses and other livestock that the settlers would have had with them. However, out of the 150 people estimated to have been part of the wagon train, only about 20-something remains were found. Theories abounded of what could have happened. Some speculated the settlers suffered a similar fate to the Donner Party, forced into cannibalism to survive the brutal winter before moving on once the snow abated. Others wanted to blame a hostile Native American tribe for slaughtering the settlers and taking the bodies back to their lands, but no evidence of this was found either. The local tribe the Ojibwe keep in mind. 
These are Kurt's words, so I have no idea how accurate this may be, offered another scenario. They told of a terrible creature, half man and half bear, that stood over ten feet tall and could swim underwater for hours at a time. It can scent blood from miles away and is incredibly territorial. The tribe had stories about how they sent their strongest and bravest warriors to kill the creature, but none of them ever returned. Most of the older tribesmen refused to speak of it or even name it. The creature's territory is apparently centered around the lake and radiates for several miles in all directions. The disappearance of the wagon train in the 1800s was the first instance of a large-scale attack. The slaughter of the Ojibwe warriors was the second. Essentially, it's a local native version of Bigfoot, except moderately more terrifying. The natives had a name for it, and I'm probably butchering the spelling, but I've tried spelling it out phonically since I've never seen it written anywhere. And unfortunately, this seems to be a small enough legend that Google is no help. They call it the Ashwan B. Mukwa. Mike and I laughed it off and all of us parted in good spirits, still not convinced of anything but a little wary, if only subconsciously. August 16, 2006. Kurt and Rob were hunting in the woods shortly after we'd left and happened upon something truly terrifying. They emailed us the next day with the story and this time pictures. Now, the email began, bears usually mark their territory by clawing trees at the edges of their territory, leaving distinctive markings. However, these markings are rarely seen higher than six or seven feet from the ground. The mark Kurt found, ten feet off the ground. Remember, he's six foot four. This was the only marking they found in the area, but decided against searching for too long. Clearly, whatever had made a marking that high off the ground was incredibly big and tall, and neither of them were willing to risk running into it. They'd only been in the area for about an hour or so, having driven in and parked the car on a dirt road before heading off to hunt. When they returned to the car, they saw something that scared them so much that to this day, they have not returned to that hunting spot. Over the tracks of their tire were two humongous footprints. One of the photos shows Kurt's foot next to the print for a size comparison, and it's important to note he wears a size 12. Even more disturbing was that to achieve that stride. The thing had to be at least nine feet tall and walking on two legs, something a bear is not capable of. The depth of the holes that claws left behind was enough to scare the daylights out of them. I'm still a skeptic about urban legends and otherworldly, supernatural occurrences, but I know my cousins well enough to know that they would never fake something like this. So either someone is playing a very elaborate hoax on them, or there is indeed something out there. I'm not saying one or the other. June 2007. A couple just aside of Lac du Flambeau, outside the supposed creature's usual roaming area, reported a vandalism to the local authorities. What baffled the couple and confused the police was their story. Over the course of several days, the couple had attempted to set up elaborate bird feeders, hoping to attract birds to photograph. They set up the birdhouse, left for the day for work, and returned in the evening to find the birdhouse demolished. Thinking they hadn't set it up correctly, they bought a new one and set it out the next morning. Rents and repeat for over a week. Finally fed up with whatever could be doing it. They suspected vandalism and decided to stay home one day, hoping to catch the culprit in the act. They set up one last bird feeder and spent the day lounging around the house, but nothing happened. Finally, as dusk settled and they prepared dinner, the husband heard a noise coming from the backyard. Grabbing flashlights, the two of them ran outside to confront whoever was destroying the birdhouse. What they described was what confused the police. Both the husband and the wife claimed to have seen what resembled a bear standing on two legs ripping the birdhouse apart with its front paws. When they turned on their flashlights and directed the beams at the creature, it turned and lumbered away, still on two legs before disappearing into the woods. Things to keep in mind. Bear paws don't have the dexterity to pick up and rip apart a birdhouse, and they certainly can't actually run away on two. At most, they can only take a few steps before dropping back to all fours. 
as their legs are too stumpy to allow them to reach a substantial speed. And it didn't gallop in the way bears usually move. The couple described its movements as a lumbering walk, more akin to when a monkey walks on two legs. Police investigated the area with canines, but were unable to turn up anything. The couple didn't report any further vandalism. July 2007, we were visiting the cousins again. Nothing much happened over the two weeks we were there except for one instance. Sam and Mike were walking down to a lake, more like an overly large pond, near the house one afternoon when they heard what sounded like a bear moving through the foliage to their side. The two of them were on the dirt road, so they turned to see if they could make out whatever it was making the noise. They both claimed to have seen something tall, large, and incredibly shaggy in the distance, lumbering off into the shadows. Needless to say, they turned around and came straight back to the house. Nothing else happened that year. July 2008, the whole family sans Kurt was visiting us in California for two weeks. Kurt stayed home because he couldn't get any off time from his job. He'd been home alone before, with just Magic and DJ for company, and being both a police officer and a seasoned hunter, he was not scared of being alone. However, one day he calls us to talk about an incident that had occurred the night before. When he spoke, his voice actually shook a bit. I don't think he'd cried or anything, but he was certainly shaken. Apparently around 11 at night, right as Kurt was about to go to bed, DJ and Magic started barking like crazy, staring out the side window towards the backyard with their tails up and hair raised. Normally, they only get like that when they scent bears or other predators while hunting and are otherwise very calm and quiet. When Kurt approached the sliding doors to try and see what could have been making them so agitated, they fell quiet except for whining very quietly, their tails tucking tightly between their legs. Kurt told us he heard what sounded to be something incredibly large moving around right outside the fence, but the house had no exterior lights that pointed in that direction, so he couldn't see anything. The dogs refused to budge from their position, so he moved to close the curtains just in case something moved into their sight and set them off again. Right as he did so, he said he heard a noise he could only describe as horrific. A deep, brassy growl with a screech overlaying it, just like Rob had heard so many years ago that night he'd snuck out. This time, however, it sounded as if the creature was just outside the fence, hidden by the shadows. Kurt proceeded to lock every single window and door, switch on every light in the house, and then take both dogs into the master bathroom, the only room in the house with no windows, and lock the door, staying there until morning. Luckily, nothing else happened that summer. It's been many years since then, and unfortunately, I have not kept in close contact with my cousins. Rob moved out sometime around 2011 when he enrolled in college and hasn't been home since. Sam joined the Marines in 2012 and hasn't been home either. Claire hasn't been in contact with me and Aunt Kelly had a sort of falling out with my mom. So they haven't been speaking either. I don't know if anything else has happened over these past few years and this little local legend seems to be low-key enough that Googling anything about it doesn't yield many results. So again, I'm not a believer in aliens or Bigfoot or ghosts or anything else, really. I don't want to say I'm a skeptic. I like to keep an open mind, but I haven't seen much to give me definitive proof either. These encounters have been the closest I've come to anything of the sort, and I'm still not quite sure what to think. I'm just glad to have written this all down somewhere. About two years ago, my younger brother passed away, and I've had weird things happen since. Like I've had a magpie follow me home and stand about a foot away from me. But the one thing that really stood out is, I was on my way home after going out to get new art supplies. And I was sat on a bus that I usually don't get on, and there was a little girl, and her mother sat on the row behind me. Everything was normal until we stopped at a red light. And the little girl started saying, Mommy, Mommy, there's a ghost. And she was saying the ghost was really kind, but out of nowhere she started describing the ghost. 
and the description was identical to my brother. It doesn't seem that weird, but that day when I got home, the picture of me and my two brothers, that's usually on my desk, was face up on the floor. There was no one home, and my window was closed. So I'm not sure if this is just a coincidence or paranormal, but it's freaking me out a little bit. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.